So good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are very pleased to have Professor A.K. Tyagi as our keynote speaker. And uh, uh, I would like to welcome again the whole, all participants uh, in this very interesting event and the coming interesting lecture. So before uh, introduce formally uh, Professor Tyagi, I would like to informally introduce Professor Tyagi. Actually, uh, there is a very small story. Uh, you can actually think about it, and I think that you maybe remember that uh, it is actually uh, 20 years back. Uh, we I met you uh, for the first time uh, on the railway station, Kanpur railway station, Kanpur Central railway station. You reached there from BRC Mumbai, and I reached there from Delhi IIT. And uh, uh, there uh, we shared a single taxi to reach to IIT Kanpur. And the whole in the whole journey from railway station to uh, IIT Kanpur, you talked about science, only science, science, and science. Uh, that time I was uh, in my uh, uh, PhD uh, line, so I was thinking, what is this man? Uh, all time he is speaking on science, science, science. We came out from our university, you know, to have uh, fun with science as well as fun with the nature or the environment. So. The next day, actually, I attended the lecture of Professor Tiagi, and I impressed a lot, and I impressed in such amount. Actually, that time, uh, probably Professor Tiagi must be around 35 or 36 years of age, and I have seen in his lecture the uh, 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 burning uh, fire lecture I have seen, and all kind of concepts he made clear to all the participants. And he actually he fights with with all the senior speakers that had the age of, of that time of 55 or 60 years. So from that lecture, sir, I became fan of you. Thank you very much. You met me that time, and then very minutely, I actually am observing you from that time to uh, till date, and I have closely monitored that uh, your you break uh, all the parts of academics or uh, you uh, achieve a lot of achievements that I will share with my audience and uh, from uh, several years I was trying to have you in Jamia uh, physically very uh, on virtual mode. So now uh, and one more point that I have observed uh, in you uh, Professor Tiagi. Uh, actually I have also seen the working environment of Professor Tiyanar Rao. And uh, we, we are witnessed uh, about his magic tone that he said in our country. But when I actually look at you, I this is actually this is my personal feeling. Uh, I thought that if someone can touch those magic tones or can break, actually every record, records are breakable. So if someone from our country can break th th that record, so sir, you must be, I think, you will be the first who can actually touch that milestone. So sir, thank you, thank you very much uh, to be with us. So now I formally uh, welcome you, sir. Uh, Professor A.K. Tyagi has joined uh, BARC uh, training school of 95 to 96 batch after MSc. He also did PhD from BARC in collaboration with the Mumbai University in 1991, and then postdoctoral research from Max Planck Institute, uh, Stuttgart, Germany, uh, in 1995-96. His present designation is Associate Director of Chemistry Group at Bhava Atomic Research Center, Mumbai, and also serving as Senior Professor of Chemistry of Homi Bhava National Institute, HBNI, Mumbai. The research interest of Professor Tyagi includes functional materials, nuclear materials, and nanomaterials. Till date, he has guided 31 PhD students and currently guiding 10 PhDs uh, under his supervision. Professor Tyagi has authored more than 600 research papers in peer-reviewed journals with research citations of 13,500 with an H index of 54. Five books and a patent also go to his credit. 
प्रोफेसर त्यागी इज द फेलो ऑफ मेनी नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल साइंस अकेडमीज लाइक महाराष्ट्र अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेज रॉयल सोसाइटी ऑफ केमिस्ट्री नेशनल अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेज इंडिया इंडियन अकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेज एंड एशिया पैसेफिक अकेडमी ऑफ मटीरियल प्रोफेसर त्यागी ऑल्सो रिसीव ए लार्ज नंबर ऑफ फेलोशिप एंड अवार्ड नेमली मैक्स प्लैंक फेलोशिप जर्मनी डॉक्टर लक्ष्मी अवार्ड बाय इंडियन एसोसिएशन ऑफ सॉलिड स्टेट एंड केमिस्ट जियोमेट्रिक साइंटिफिक आई सी एस अवार्ड बाय इंडियन थर्मल एनालिसिस सोसाइटी गोल्ड मेडल ऑफ इंडियन न्यूक्लियर सोसाइटी एम आर आई एस आई मेडल सी आर एस आई ब्रॉन्ज मेडल डॉक्टर तरुण दत्ता मेमोरियल अवार्ड फ्रॉम आई ए एन सी ए एस होमी बाबा साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी अवार्ड which was confirmed by dr apj abdul kalam former president of india indian chemical society's rd desai memorial award dai src outstanding researcher award rajiv goyal prize in chemical sciences dai group achievement award the list is endless actually pr si professor siana rao national prize in chemical sciences ISPB award for excellence in chemical sciences MRSI ICSP material science senior award coastal chemical research society award ISCA platinum jubilee lecture award metallurgist of the year award from ministry of steel government of india CRSI silver medal award MRSI senior rao prize in advanced material National Prize in Solid State and Materials Chemistry, Acharya P C Ray Memorial Prize from Indian Science Congress. Professor Tyagi has been the member of various high power committees such as INSA National Committee for Crystallography, Board of Studies Chemical Sciences H B N I D A E, and just completed the tenure of D S P Project Assessment Committee P A C. and many more uh, committees so you are there so with these kind words i request uh, professor tyagi uh, to please deliver his keynote lecture and he will be delivering a lecture on crystallographically designed functional nanomaterial and my dear audience i can bet you that yeah, you will ask more time to and more time to allow to speak professor tyagi so so with these words i invite you to deliver your keynote lecture sir so you are mu muted please unmute your mic sir what about now are you able to hear me yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay sir. okay yeah yeah okay uh, thanks professor fakir ahmed so how you began informally let me also begin informally i remember very well our first meeting uh, at platform of kanpur uh, railway station that was in december 2001 yes and to be very precise it was on 4 december 2001 oh. i remember the date also and apart from you and me we had one more young phd student now he is a professor in iit kharagpur professor pradhan like you he also was doing phd from iit bombay so he also was in same taxi which was sent by the organizers to pick three of us and more or less same thing he also told when i met him a couple of years back at iit kharagpur he said all throughout you were talking about science work this there and all so that's how maybe i am i maybe can't discuss many more things so i focus mainly on science and uh, you are very accurate in predicting my age also i was indeed 36 year old that time so all uh, that you what you remembered and what you could you know interpolate is absolutely correct and i always used to like to discuss uh, young students though i was myself pretty young but you were much younger so i always had a feeling that whenever we meet people uh, different people we should discuss as much size as we can that's what i saw in germany germany i had been to 10 times and people discuss lot of science even during coffee time also so maybe somewhere that i picked this kind of culture 
and as regard uh, record of uh, professor sina rao is concerned certain people are above all this so one person you know whom we should not even think of we should not even talk of uh, coming close is none other than bharatatna professor sina rao so he should be above all all throughout with these few words now i will start my talk i will request my colleague to help me in sharing the powerpoint file yes so are you able to see slides now yes sir okay so already you have mentioned the topic of my talk crystallographically design functional nano materials and i knew from the pie chart which you have been sharing with me occasionally that there are number of young students who are participating in this conference so my talk is designed in such a way that it will it will be appealing to practicing chemist as well as the budding chemist both the varieties of delegates i am going to address so next few slide i am going to discuss how does structure matter as far as properties are concerned what is nano material why a young person who is attending let us say this uh, conference should make a career in nano materials and i will also show one slide to very precisely explain what do I, what do we mean by functional materials so let me move forward first question is why at all one should work on low dimensional matters you can see clearly from this slide when a millimeter size object is downsized to micrometer there is no change in physics and chemistry everything is routine but the moment from micrometer you go down to nanometer entire physics and chemistry is new i call it call it emergence of new physics and chemistry which was not known to my generation when we were doing bsc and msc in early and mid 80s why it is so the reason is nano dimension is equivalent to characteristic length scales at which physics works say bohr radius for example it is in nano dimension only and also the scale at which nature operates dna virus proteins all are in the dimension of nanometer that is the reason that nano dimension is extraordinary physical properties start to get modified quantum size effect van capital ring it was it was unthinkable during my bsc and msc days chemical properties we talk about melting point low ring melting point used to be taught to us as a fingerprint but no longer melting point is no longer a fingerprint melting point can be changed considerably while playing with size and shape of the particles hardness and we talk about ceramics which are ductile unthinkable but now what is one can make ceramics which are ductile one can also change the structure catalysis reactivity etc classic example is gold normal size gold is noble as we all know gold has been used for aesthetic reasons for thousands of years but the moment you convert gold to nano gold nano gold loses what is called as its nobility nano gold is no longer noble so if anybody wants to sell you jewelry made of nano gold please don't buy it it will be dead investment nano gold is chemically so reactive that it is able to oxidize carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide even at room temperature why it is so interface and surface become very important the dominant role is from interface and surface unlike the bulk counterparts so this is the first uh, introduction to young students what do we mean by nano and why it is fascinating to work on nano next question is on classification of materials during my education days i was taught that you can classify materials based on origin you can call them inorganic organic based on property you can call them insulator semiconductor metal or by bonding you can say material is ionic covalently bonded solid metallic or hydrogen bonded solid etc you can also classify based on structure layer materials order disorder amorphous and so on last 25 or 30 years or so one more classification came into picture and that is based on size and shape here we say material is bulk nano in nano we say 3d 2d 1d and 0d most recent classification is based on functionality in this we say a given material is either magnetic optical electrical catalyst or sensor etc 
in next slide you will appreciate in a better way what i mean to say by classification as per functionality of a material well in this slide you will see i have classified five all together different materials let us see tin oxide is semiconductor it is used to make sensors for sensing the presence of ammonia and h2s toxic gases what we do we measure resistivity of this tin oxide a semiconductor and resistivity value gives us the amount of ammonia or h2s in air next is atriodopthoria which is an insulator and this is used in one of the institutes of dae kalpakam indira gandhi center kalpakam they have developed our colleagues have developed sensors for finding water ingress in molten sodium molten sodium is used as a uh, moderator as a coolant for uh, phosphorus reactors and here we measure ionic conductivity which gives us the value of water in molten sodium calixarin we all know is organic compound it has been used to develop sensors for finding the presence or absence of cesium 137 in nuclear waste is a gamma emitter basically it is an electrochemical sensor silver rhodamin 6g is sensor made in my own group it is a hybrid it is organic inorganic material and it is used to sense the presence of lead 2 plus down to ppb level in potable water and basically we measure fluorescence of rhodamin 6g and this gives us information about presence or absence of lead 2 plus in potable water fifth one is conducting polymer polyaniline organic compound and colleague from chemistry division of brc have developed progesterone antibody sensor and in this case conductivity of polyaniline is measured which uh, will translate into the presence quantitative presence of progesterone antibodies in the body so five compounds which have nothing in common their origin bonding structure everything is different still i have put them in same table in same category because they all have one thing in common and that is that they all are used to make sensors so they are sensor materials so this is the most recent definition of classifying materials based on functionality so now you know second keyword of my talk you know now nanomaterial and you also know what do i mean by functional materials next of course comes structure my talk is going to be focused on structural aspects i am showing i am showing here two structures of same compound alpha al2o3 is having corundum structure gamma al2o3 has got cubic structure spinel alpha al2o3 has a lattice which is comprising of scp hexagonal close packed packing of oxide ions in which two third ions are occupied by aluminum ions aluminum os is octahedra you can see let us see spinel structure gamma l2o3 this has got a formula like this this compound has got one cationic vacancy and one anionic vacancy you may ask a question which one is better i would say it depends on the application if you want to make a laser if you want to make a highly luminescent material then you must use alpha l2o3 don't use gamma l2o3 because alpha l2o3 is a better uh, optical host compared to gamma l2o3 because we have got same type of octahedra so the line width of laser emission is very narrow when you have got what is called as crystallographically singular sites so same site gamma l2o3 has got two types of uh, polyhedra alo6 octahedra and alo tetrahedra it is called as crystallographically plural sites and in addition gamma l2o3 has got vacancies so for optical applications this compound is not to be used this is structure but this is an excellent material as far as catalysis is concerned it is a wonderful support material so for catalysis you use gamma l2o3 not alpha l2o3 and for laser application like ruby laser you use alpha l2o3 not gamma l2o3 one problem i will coin for you friends if you can make alpha al2o3 in nano form you are going to publish a paper in nature material it's a challenge to make alpha l2o3 in nano form and vice versa it's a challenge to make gamma l2o3 in bulk form if you can do that be assured you are going to publish damn good papers 
So I'm going to coin some problems also for young faculty members and young PhD students. Uh, in science, we should be very open. In science, if we start to hide, uh, I think you are in a wrong profession. We should never shy off sharing the ideas. You never lose much, I would say. Maybe you lose a couple of papers, but 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 the community as such gains a lot uh, when you discuss very openly with people. Now comes what makes a given material amenable to form nanomaterial or low dimension material. A chemist should never forget bonding concept. So certain types of bonding are responsible for material to make low dimensional. Bond termination, condition saturation also facilitate the formation of low dimension materials. We should not forget the concepts of ionic radii, oxidation state, polarizability of cations and anions. I will spend some time on these aspects. Molecular crystals in general are easy to convert into 2D compared to extended solids like oxides. This is of course intrinsic properties of material which you cannot change. But you can play with synthesis protocol. You can passive at a surface. You can use precursors. You can use vapor or solution based synthesis. You can use template. By this artificially engineered approach, you can make a variety of nanomaterials. I will show examples as I proceed further. Now, let me go back to basics which you have read in BSc. How does ionic size and polarizability of cations and anions matter? Many times while working on nanomaterials, people completely disconnect with these concepts. Please never do that. Concepts of bonding, oxidation state, structure, etc. should always be in top of your mind while you do research on nanomaterials. If I write on blackboard CaCl2, CdCl2, CdI2 and ask you a question whether these three compounds will have same structure, you will say yes, they are looking alike, but not true. CaCl2 has got close pair structure, CdCl2 has got sheet type structure, you can see they are sheets and CdI2 also has got sheet type structure. The difference lies in polarizability. The high polarizability of cation and anion in this case makes these two halides adopt sheet structure unlike calcium chloride which is a closed pack structure. So you can never get a thin layer, a 2D sheet of calcium chloride whereas you can get 2D sheet of CdCl2 and CdI2 very easily. One more example, one more puzzle. If I write on blackboard three more compounds NiO, NiS, NiAs and ask students or even further matter professors do you think the structure will be different? At a glance, you will say, yes, sir. No, not, not correct. Cubic NIO and hexagonal NIS have got closed pair structure, whereas hexagonal NIS has got sheet type structure. Again comes the role of polarizability. So you can exfoliate this compound, this compound, this compound, but you cannot exfoliate this compound, this compound. So while making materials for 2D structure application, Please work on systems which have got high polarizability cations and anions. Don't spend time on oxides and don't spend even half an hour on chlorides. You will waste two years, I think is going to come. All these things I have learned hard way, by the way. These things you learn not by reading, these things you learn by doing. I move forward. Most of the metal charcogenites adopt layered structure. Have you wondered why? In research, you must ask questions to yourself. Why it is so that metal oxides predominantly adopt closed pair structure and metal so are metal fluorides, but sulfides and salinides and tellurides adopt layered structure. Again, the reason lies with high polarizability of anion. When you have got highly polarizable alliance like sulfur, selenium, etc., you are not having a direct bond along C axis you make a sandwich type of structure. So in AB plane, you have got sandwich, you have got like bread, okay, and in between you have got a hollow space. So like you make sandwich, you take two slices and you can stuff whatever you want to stuff, tomato, onion, etc. Okay, and you make a sandwich. Likewise, in layered structure, you can intercalate, deintercalate ions and make 
myriad types of functional materials. So these are the basic concepts which a chemist should never forget. I move forward. In my group, we work on all types of functional materials. It's a very strong group comprising of more than 20, 25 people. Many of them, many of my students are themselves now very seasoned scientists, better than me, I would say. Okay. So we use uh, different approaches like crystallographic approach, metastable approach, defects approach, and hybrid approach. In today's talk, I am going to focus mainly on crystallographic approach and metastable approach. These two approaches we discuss. My visit to Jamia is over pending. Whenever Corona permits, I will visit Jamia and discuss all these things also. Now I move forward. Again, concepts. See, my talks uh, are always uh, in workshop mode. And that's what Professor Rao also always appreciates. His own talks are also in workshop mode. If in talks you show 100 graphs uh, and 100 tables, uh, believe me, you disconnect with the audience. <laughs> so never do that. You must go deep in concept. Even if you skip some data, perfectly all right. Data they can read from papers also. They can download and they can read whatever you have published. But idea of a talk is to go beyond data presentation. Well, here at center, I show you calcium titanate, the first perovskite discovered in the year 1839 in Russia, in Ural mountains. Calcium titanate does not have any property. Too much of stability and too much of symmetry makes calcium titanate devoid of any property. But calcium titanate is mother of entire plethora of functional materials. You replace calcium by barium, you get barium titanate, a wonderful ferroelectric material discovered in DuPont in 1944-45 during World War II. And till date, no material can re could replace barium titanate in electroceramic applications. Play with the composition, create oxygen vacancy, and beyond certain oxygen vacancies, Vacancies undergo ordering and perovskite becomes brown right Ba2IN2O5, a wonderful oxide ion conductors used in SOFC applications. Replace calcium by bismuth, a lone pair ion, titanium by iron, a magnetic ion, you get BIFeO3, a wonderful multiferroid material. And you can also make oxyfluorides as you see here. You can replace C and Ti by two magnetic ions. I will show some results. You get CECRO3, you can cause ordering of B site. This was the ordering of NIN, and this is the ordering of cations at B site. You get double perovskite, which are excellent ferroelectric, ferromagnetic materials. You can also make layered materials, uh, perovskite, fluoride, perovskite, fluoride, perovskite. And you get in turn what is called as orvilius structures. Orvilius lattice is so flexible, you can incorporate almost entire periodic table to this. So by simple concepts of solid state chemistry, one can create from a boring compound, absolutely boring compound like CATIO3, excellent, wonderful and useful materials, provided you know concepts. And I will again repeat, these concepts are often not found in textbooks. These concepts are done, you learn by discussion, and also by reading and by doing more and more work. Now I move to approach number two, metastable approach. Just to share with students, please don't get confused. Metastable materials are not unstable. They can be extremely stable as far as kinetically is concerned. Classic example is diamond and graphite. When I give talk in person, I ask students which is more stable, diamond and graphite. People say diamond, which is not correct. <laughs> Thermodynamically speaking, graphite is more stable than diamond. But diamond is diamond. Diamond does not become graphite because diamond and graphite have got very high activation at the barrier. And that is responsible for not allowing diamond to become graphite. So, in nutshell, metal cell materials should not be confused with unstable materials. In my group, we work a lot on these materials. Like we have made metastability can have different origin. This compound is metastable because it has got very high condensation number of scandium. This compound is metastable because it has got unusually high pecking. Other way around, we have got alpha VOPO3 hole twice. 
metal stable because it has got very poor packing see the opposite reason extremely high packing extremely low packing both can make material both can render metal stability to a material we have got low valency of cerium making it metal stable we have got high valency of chromium making it metal stable so basically we move away from ideality one thing is common all these materials they are made in my group only some excellent papers have come out of this all these materials are not found in phase diagrams so take home message to faculty members is that please think beyond phase diagrams if you restrict your understanding to only phase diagrams i'm bit scared to say that you will work on materials which are somewhat boring i call them maha boring okay and professor rao says many more things <laughs> let's let not discuss that <laughs> he says if you want to work on um, stale materials you will work on silica <laughs> he is very fond of this but let me not say maybe he can say after all he is bharatratna but in my case uh, of course what he says is correct also i move forward as i mentioned defects i will not discuss much in today's talk just to share with you that defects are not as bad as one may think in fact many compounds are existing in lab or in nature only because of presence of defects it is called as defects induced stabilization of metal stable or unstable materials when you introduce point defects you introduce higher entropy and higher entropy leads to excess stabilization so you can imagine defects also can play a very important role this approach is called as defects engineering sometime we'll discuss in person when i come over there likewise hybrid materials also i am going to skip in today's talk because today's talk is uh, i am aiming for different things altogether so hybrids also please bear with me all these beautiful hybrids are made by my colleagues this one for example you are able to see my colleague is able to bend it like this this compound has got 90% oxide oxides are brittle you can't bend a chalk like this but once you make a polymer composite with 10% polymer it becomes so flexible same oxide it becomes very flexible so these are the concepts of you know hybrids in hybrids interface strain defect coupling all these things are very important they play a big role but i am going to skip all this but we can discuss now i am slowly slowly coming to theme of my talk well i must say my group is not a hardcore uh, nano group also hardcore nano group is the one they do synthesis take micrography take do synthesis take micrography publish okay in my group we have different approach we are more of solid state chemist of uh, professor jg style professor sinarov style okay we are that kind of solid state chemist where structure is given lot of importance so is chemical bonding so are coordination numbers so is other things so we first arrive at a given compound which we have to which i have to give to my student young student first we see the structure first we try to optimize arrangement of atoms bond length bond angle degree of order disorder and defects and distortion engineering and once we identify a compound based on crystallography concepts we then go to nano attributes then we play with size shape morphology microstructure surface atom surface area energy and porosity by marriage of these two streams of chemistry you work on intersect this intersect you optimize best of both and you make excellent functional materials with far far superior catalysis i'll give some examples sorption ion exchange redox behavior magnetism mechanical resistance reactivity and so on so always have rational approach don't don't do only photography okay you should make good science based on concepts never forget fundamental concepts so of course maybe i can spare time don't spend much on this just to share with you that you can play with the structure there are the tools at your disposal a chemist can play with the structure bonding composition size shape microstructure and create different types of properties which one can't even think of having said that i must emphasize that you should have tremendous control on synthesis unless you are a good synthetic synthesis chemist i think it is difficult to work on materials in my group we use number of techniques ceramic method soft chemical method we use intercalation deintercalation ion exchange 
<coughs> some examples I will give. We are very fond of high pressure synthesis also. It's a separate talk altogether. I'm not going to discuss anything today. We're a lot of solid state chemistry under high pressure. We make glasses by melt and quest technique and we do processing by chemical methods like printing, etc. So this is also a separate talk. Uh, I have a separate 90 minutes talk on synthesis of materials. Sometime definitely I will be very glad to discuss with you. So soft chemical synthesis is the focus of today's talk. Why it is so? Because by soft chemical synthesis you can have shape control, size control, you can play with surface area. I will show some examples where we have got materials with very large surface area. You can play with porosity, you can have surface modification and you can have a control over homogeneity and above all you can make what is called as meta stable materials which you can't make by solid state by solid state you will always get material which is found in phase diagram so combustion reaction many people know toki himself works a lot on combustion reaction very simple method whichever university you come from whichever college you come from you can make excellent nanomaterials by combustion method so taking a beaker oxidant like metal nitrate take one of them they are called as fuel you can take hydrogen you can take urea glycine citric acid etc hmta is hexamethylene tetraacetic acid ascorbic acid vitamin c okay these days doctors say you should pop up more vitamin c depco is tertiary amine diazo bicyclo octane take any one of them what facilities you need do you need multi core rupees facilities you need facilities of couple of hundred rupees. Here is this. You need a beaker. You need a hot plate. Nothing else. And a humid, of course. Dissolve oxidant and fuel in water and slowly, slowly dehydrate and increase temperature by no turning the knob. This gel undergoes combustion. And when this flame is ignited, it propagates by its own because it has got very high degree of exothermicity. So it is sort of self-propagating reaction. You get by combustion method all types of materials. But here I am showing you examples of materials which have got cerium in 3 plus state. Cerium prefers to have 4F0 configuration, 4 plus. Cerium is difficult to synthesize in 3 plus state because C3 plus is 4F1, C4 4 plus, 4 plus is 4F0. And we know 4F1 is much, much, much less stable than 4F0, completely uh, filled, completely uh, unoccupied, okay, vacant. By combustion, you will never get compounds of cerium in 3 plus. But what we did, a very innovative thing, this young student of mine, Rakesh, did this all this chemistry, his PhD work, incidentally. So, whatever product we get from combustion, make a pellet transfer in a platinum or tantalum foil put in a quartz tube surround with zirconium sponge coupled with a dynamic uh, vacuum you can use diffusion pump evacuate and seal with a fire oxygen hydrogen torch or oxygen lpg torch this ampule has got a vacuum now but when this ampule goes to the furnace this zirconium we know from basic solid state chemistry acts as oxygen getter. Zirconium sponge is able to suck whatever little oxygen is present in this ampule. So partial pressure of oxygen drops considerably in this ampule. And because of that, you get compounds of CE in trivalent state against what phase diagrams and what thermodynamics would have predicted. In fact, I may share a joke with you. Uh, when I gave this work to Rakesh, my student, I have a colleague sitting here. So my senior colleague discouraged him. Uh, senior colleague said, Are, Dr. Tyagi, what kind of problem he has given you? This defies the complete understanding of chemistry. Of course, the senior colleague was not senior than me, of course. He was junior to me, but much senior to Rakesh. I will tell you his name afterwards. <laughs> He said, you will spend two years, nothing is going to come. Rakesh came to me, sir, so and so, sir, tells me this is a non-workable problem. I told Rakesh, he spent three months. We are going to laugh at this person. <laughs> and that's what happened. We laughed at this person straight out. Because I knew, so this person, I'm not blaming. He was correct. 
this person saw existence or non-existence of compounds only from conventional thermodynamics point of view whereas i have spent a lot of time in stuttgart next line is stuart okay and i knew that there is enough solid state chemistry beyond phase diagrams so please don't get worked up work on challenging problems very important professors should give challenging problem to of course the best students those who are not good they will be they'll be doomed of course so give them problems which, which are workable but students who are high profile they should be given problems which can challenge their potential luckily i have many in my career i must say that so to cut short the story we made number of new compounds i will run through we made ccro3 almost 12 years back time has gone very fast uh, okay this compound turned out to be a multifunction material it shows a relaxer ferroelectric behavior as you can see from the data of dielectric constant water temperature it shows anti ferromagnetism as seen by neutron diffraction and its band gap is 3.04 ev so compound was expected to show photocatalysis also not surprising at all because co compound has got band gap about 3 3.04 ev or so so we could use this compound for degradation of rhodamine b by photochemical ways what was more surprising was that this compound could be used as a redox catalyst in organic reactions also i know there are there are many organic chemistry people so that's why i want to discuss some organic chemistry also incidentally i go back to 85 in 1985 i did msc in organic chemistry so i am not of organic chemistry so i am a solid state chemist for last 35 36 years but somewhere in my mind somewhere in my heart the love and affection for organic chemistry continues and it will never die so whenever i get a opportunity to work on organic chemistry problems i jump into this well this compound was used as a catalyst to oxidize secondary benzylic alcohols to corresponding carbonyls very cheap materials to very expensive value added chemicals and we got 100% conversion 100% selectivity i must acknowledge dr radha jayaram my collaborator from icit mumbai so encourage with success of ccro3 i told young student that let us make entire series uh, of uh, composition li1 minus x c x ro3 once we made this series we were astonished to see the result we have got linear variation in band gap that's what you want from the point of view of photocatalysis so now we understand very well by that time that band gap tailoring is possible to induce by knowing the concepts of crystallography i move forward interesting magnetism was observed probably i skip uh, this part as i have many more things to share with you uh, i move forward to one more excellent compound cso3 this compound also does not exist in phase diagram for simple reason because cerium is in 3 plus state so how do we do that make combustion reaction take glycine as the fuel you get a precursor you get a compound which phase diagram might expect you get c.5 sc.5 o1.75 at a glance you know as a chemist if you knock out 0.25 oxygen from here you get c sco3 so from fluoride you get perovskite oxidized you get fluoride this kind of compounds are very important for applications i will give some more examples so this compound of course magnetism wise it was only paramagnetic band gap was 3.2 ev and compound shows a beautiful blue emission you dope some terbium you get blue emission coupled with green emission the compound shows multi functional properties however the most important result of this work was is shown in this slide we made by combustion method c.5 sc.5 o1.75 reduce you get cso3 oxidize you get fluoride so this couple of structure you can interconvert n number of times remember 5 minutes back i showed you one more compound ccro3 surprisingly ccro3 does not show this interconversion ccro3 adopt this structure and once you oxidize it shows phase separation to co2 and cr2o3 why it is so 
we broke our head answer was there with us within half an hour reason is uh, scandium 3 plus is at the border in terms of ionic size scandium 3 plus can adopt a fluoride structure it can satisfy condition number 8 it can satisfy condition number 6 also so for making compound which are interconvertible you must very carefully select the right combination of cations which can satisfy coordination number requirements of two end member structures in case of chromium chromium is three chromium three plus very comfortable with octahedra but chromium three plus never adopts cubic coordination that's why cso3 showed a phase separation whereas csco3 showed a phase transformation from prostate to fluoride so you have to select the right size cations if you work on this kind of very interesting properties i will show a still better example of course we made one more series pr1 minus x ex i will not spend much time this is candidate that was chromate okay aim was to play with band gap from 4.74 we got 2.91 etc again photochemical degradation all that i will not spend time because i have a couple of more things which are quite exciting and which you will definitely appreciate and you may get some ideas for pursuing phds before that let me spend one minute on another class of materials that is pyrochlor a to b to o7 how perovskites are a b o3 pyrochlores are a to b to o7 and pyrochlores can also support diverse functionalities pyrochlores can support you any conductivity catalysis optical applications they are used as thermal barrier coatings and they have got tremendous nuclear applications they are also used for magnetic properties why it is so that pyrochlor have got these many functional properties the reason lies in the structure my talk is as i mentioned is predominantly based on a structure pyrochlor structure is an ordered variant of fluoride structure let me explain what is the difference between these two in pyrochlor a to b to o7 a and b cations are occupying distinct positions a is here b is here if you swap a to b and b to a you make from fully ordered to fully disordered so in pyrochlor structure by playing with ra by rb ratio you can have a tremendous control on degree of disorder and this particular uh, you know property of pyrochlor lattice of enabling it to optimize the degree of order or degree of disorder is responsible for inducing different types of properties you can see we made a new pyrochlor c to o7 this compound uh, has got cerium in 3 plus state and you oxidize from O7 to O7.5 then to O8 and here lies an important result. So O7 becomes O7.5 and O7.5 becomes O8. So clockwise this compound is able to pick up oxygen and anti-clockwise this compound is giving oxygen. So I coined a new word uh, way back in 2009 that this compound is acting as an oxygen sponge this compound can give oxygen at your will that's why this compound turned out to be this system turned out to be an excellent oxygen storage capacitor and they find a lot of applications in catalysis i'll give some examples but here i want to ask a question unfortunately face to face we are not there i would have loved to get answer from you why it is so that Ce2Zr2O7 pyrochlor shows this kind of transformation reversible and titanium pyrochlor collapses? Reason is same. Titanium is too small to have coordination number of fluoride lattice. Titanium 4 plus cannot adopt so easily coordination number 8. Zirconium is comfortable with 6 fold coordination and also with 8 fold coordination. So, again, message is that you have to have right combination of cations this is very important and of course this compound uh, my friend from ncl pune he used uh, this compound for catalysis uh, he used this compound for what is called as oxidative dehydrogen reaction uh, ods reaction is used to introduce unsaturation in organic compounds so ethyl benzene can you can convert to styrene by knocking out hydrogen from here you introduce double bond as you can see here and styrene is very important ethyl benzene is very cheap styrene has got high value 
it is a monomer to make polystyrene so you see simple solid state chemistry could be used by our friends in ncl pune some catalysts were characterized before and after uh, you know performing long term reaction as i mentioned this is a very stable uh, system for about 3 days continuously if you perform conversion of ethyl benzene to styrene uh, it does not break that is the beauty of crystallographically designed nano materials the, the the main theme of my today's talk and of course uh, another colleague uh, another collaborator dr gopinath used this compound after decorating with palladium for suzuki coupling suzuki coupling you know is nobel discovery it is able to get you new carbon carbon bond so iodo benzene and phenyl boronic acid they could be clubbed and you get new carbon carbon bond we have done different combinations so this work also gets good uh, appreciation in terms of citations so again you see in this work why this compound turned out to be an excellent uh, catalyst because here nano attributes were coupled with crystallographic attributes so together uh, when you use best of both you get this kind of interesting materials so i move forward uh, this compound was also used for uh, oxidation of carbon dioxide to carbon carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide as you can see we got very high catalytic activity for transformation of co to co2 co is very toxic whereas co2 is much less toxic that's why it is advisable to convert co to co2 so that you can minimize the toxic value of uh, this uh, highly you know hazardous gas some more systems are there but i would like to change the topic slightly likewise we made dysprosium doped uh, samarium zirconate here also the aim was uh, to tailor the band gap you can see band gap could be tailored from 3.81 to 3.62 3.58 final 3.44 ev so in photoanalysis it is, it is very important to play with band gap and uh, we investigated a model reaction namely xylenol orange degradation by photochemical ways and in this case you could get t half as low as 3.4 minutes so it means in 3.4 minutes itself you can transform you can degrade half of the concentration of xylenol orange the toxic dye some more examples in pyrochlor but probably i will skip so that we have time for discussion also yes some more simple chemistry it may so happen that you may have to dope anions See, cationic doping is somewhat easy. Suppose I want to dope cation B into cation A. It is very simple. You can take salt of cation A and salt of cation B and take them in appropriate ratio and do the chemistry. You get A one minus X B X. X can be anything depending upon the size and other factors. But doping by anions at times becomes tricky. So I thought I will show some work done in the group. where we have found a very simple method to dope nitrogen and boron in titania for boron doping you may take boric acid as the boron source and for nitrogen doping don't go for any exotic method you can take nitrogen source like urea amino acid like glycine you can take amines and do simple beaker chemistry you can incorporate a decent amount of boron and nitrogen in a given oxide oxide can be anything in this case i selected tio2 because tio2 is a very nice material in terms of photocatalysis you can see there is a red shift in absorption so tio2 band gap is here and then band gap is lowered considerably so results are here we use for water splitting tio2 as synthesize was not so good you partially reduce you get better activity you incorporate nitrogen you still get better activity and in tio2 nitrogen doped you impregnate palladium you have considerable enhancement in the yield of hydrogen by water splitting so by simple concepts of chemistry you can play with the structure you can play with the composition and composition playing leads to different types of properties in this case it was nothing but tailoring of band gap of course ricro4 ricro3 are another examples which made probably i will try to skip this so that we have some time yeah 
it will be unfair from my side if I don't discuss yet another simple method to make nano rods. Nano rods of many oxides can be made by what is called as simple physical vapor deposition. You don't need hi-fi facilities. You need a furnace only and a quartz tube and flowing atmosphere. So take zinc metal in a boat and heat either under argon or air or argon air mixture or only argon only air just by this vapor liquid solid mechanism vls mechanism we could get this kind of beautiful rods of zinc oxide this one also has high appreciation in terms of citations not only that you also get material which is almost defect free defect emission is not seen defect green emission is seen in this region if you make zinc oxide by many methods so here is a simple method for making nanocrystalline zinc oxide rods, highly anisotropic rods, which are almost free from defects and which do not have green emission, which is undesirable for many applications. One more simple method, which I thought I should share with you. You can also use concepts of textbook chemistry. For example, we wanted to make gamma alumina for some application. Gamma alumina, I gave example in the beginning itself. You take aluminum nitrate and you take ammonium carbonate. Just do grinding. It is called as mechanochemical synthesis. Just by grinding, you are able to get rid of ammonium ion, carbonate ion, nitrate ion. It is like acid based reaction in solid state. And you get gamma alumina. We have got a surface area of 400 meter square per gram. So you see the kind of uh, simple chemistry can lead to very interesting properties. Some more concepts are there, how to play with the structures. We made K2C PO4 hole twice, K2 ZR PO4 hole twice for nuclear applications. Vernicite is another you know, matrix which has got layered structure. It has got layers of MnO6 octahedra shared by edges. In between, we have got potassium ions, as you can see. So it, this compound can act as ion exchanger. So again, this is a good example of clubbing nano property with crystallographic properties. And this was used by us to separate strontium-90, which is a beta emitter, which is used for cancer treatment, as you can see here. Now I would like to conclude my talk while saying some broad things. So in today's one hour talk or so, I discussed the rational approach to design nanomaterials. And I emphasize considerably that crystallographic concepts should be used. Don't blindly make nanomaterials, first you must see the structure for a given application, and then only you must try to fine tune the size. Chemical concepts one should never forget concepts of bonding, concepts of coordination number, concepts of poly polyhedral sharing, very important. Soft chemical roots were discussed by me in today's talk because hot chemical roots gives you far superior powder properties. And I discuss two or three examples where the structure was optimized to design excellent materials which acted as oxygen storage capacitors. And simple methods were discussed with you for making metal oxides wherein oxygen could be partially replaced by other anions like nitrogen or chlorine or boron. And I give model reactions like water splitting, dye degradation, etc. Some books which may be useful to you. Uh, I published my first book in the year 2008. This is Advanced Techniques for Materials Characterization. Then in 2012, another book came, and that one is on functional materials. These two books will be useful for delegates of uh, this conference. Third one is materials under extreme conditions may not be very useful for the delegates of this conference, but definitely faculty members may find it useful. Now, in another two or three months, three more books are going to be published. They are at proofreading stage presently. It is handbook on synthesis strategies for advanced materials. So volume one is on techniques and fundamentals. Volume two is on processing and functionalization of materials. And volume three is on materials specific synthesis strategies. I may share with you that before lockdown began in last March, we had chapters only for volume one. 
last march government started lockdown subsequently we had restrictions many people could not come to office even now also so this one year and two or three months we used very efficiently to write articles for the book and one one book became three books originally we had some 25 chapters and now all three books put together all three volumes put together we have about 60 chapters so difficulties will come of course always but you can convert difficulties into opportunities up to you only well i must conclude my talk by thanking uh, professor toki rehmat whom as he mentioned in the beginning i know for last 20 years as a young student a number of colleagues and students are part of this work rakesh farin vinita achari balaji jay kumar list is uh, continuing there are many more who have now left and they have made their own career in different departments. Some of them are permanent, most of them are permanent colleagues here. And I showed number of collaborators, I showed their name also. But in case if I forgot to show any name, let me mention that this, all this work had tremendous collaborators and I must acknowledge them also. And I must thank you all for being connected uh, to this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for very interesting and thought-provoking talk. And uh, I must tell you, sir, before actually we start uh, the questions uh, session, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Fana Riyad. Actually, sir, we are collecting the questions from the chat box. The audience are asking, so we are collecting. So I invite Dr. Fana Riyad to, uh, on behalf of the participant, may ask questions to Professor Jai. Good afternoon, sir. There are many questions that have been posed by the participants. One of the questions is that how defects can lead to stability of materials. Please explain with examples. Yes, yes, yes. I'll do both. First, the concept. This free energy delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And we know from physical chemistry that for making a compound stable and more stable, free energy of formation should be lowered. It should become negative and more negative. If it is positive, you cannot get the compound. So delta H, you are not able to play with it. But by introducing defects, you induce entropy because defects are nothing but disorder. So it is defects induce entropy. So delta S goes up. So delta H minus T delta S. So the negative term of free energy formula increases and in this process delta G of formation decreases. It becomes negative and more negative. So this is the concept of physical chemistry. Now comes one example, typical example which comes to my mind is yttria stabilized zirconia. ZRO2 is monoclinic at room temperature. If you heat to high temperature, it becomes tetragonal. If you heat further high, it becomes cubic. Cubic zirconia can be stabilized by introducing some defects by incorporating yttrium 3 plus. ZR4 plus I replace by partially yttrium 3 plus. So formula becomes ZR1 minus X, Y, X, O2 minus X by 2. This X by 2 is oxygen vacancy. So presence of oxygen vacancy, which we do by incorporating Y3 plus leads to stabilization of cubic zirconia at room temperature. This is the classic example. There is a very interesting question, sir, by an undergraduate student. It is uh, that why is it that only certain substances can be prepared as nanomaterials? Because you have cited the example of Al203, which is very difficult to prepare as nanomaterials. So which properties of a substance determine whether it can be prepared in nano size? My fourth or fifth slide had two sets of properties. One is intrinsic, certain chemical bonding, certain coordination requirements, certain, certain bond requirement, certain polarizability expectations make a material amenable for making nano dimension. That is the intrinsic uh, approach. But my in that same slide, I showed extre extrinsic uh, parameters also. For example, a given material which one can never think of making into nano can make into nano by using template. So make a nano template and do chemistry in nano template and remove the template 
and you get nano material. So there are some intrinsic properties, but there are some chemical methods, some physical methods by which any material can be converted to nano. So it is not that materials can't be converted only. Only thing is that certain materials have inherent tendency to go into nano, and certain materials have to be pushed. Like classroom, some students will be very attentive. You can teach them very well. But some students you have to push. Not that you cannot push anybody. You can push anybody. The other question is that, sir, can we introduce metal oxides between the layered structure of metal chalcogenides to enhance their catalytic efficiency? Yes, yes, very good question. In fact, in my group, we we'll insert many things. We insert carbon, we insert carbon nanotubes, we insert metal oxides also. So do a precursor reaction, take a moly salt, okay? And then take a metal salt and do reaction in such a way. And you can take thio urea also, okay? One can take ammonium molybdate, thio urea, and you can take some metal salt. In this process, do chemistry in such a way that moly sulfide is formed with intercalated metal oxide. You can incorporate nickel oxide, for example. Of course, it can be done. Then, sir, can we synthesize cerium based perovskites with any method other than combustion methods such as hydrothermal at low temperature? Uh, of course, uh, you can make cerium based perovskites uh, by many methods. You can make by hydrothermal also, you can make by precipitation, you can make by microwave method, you can make by many methods. But I must add here that you will make cerium based compounds where cerium is in 4 plus state. If you want to make compounds of C in C plus state, then you have to introduce one more step, and that is in the presence of zirconium sponge. There's a question on gold nanoparticles, which is uh, that uh, it has been heard that gold nanoparticles are inert. Then why they are used in surface plasmon resonance? Kindly clear the concept. No, no, no. Gold nanoparticles uh, are chemically not that inert. I'm not saying that gold will become gold oxide by its own. Gold will not become gold oxide, but but catalytically they are very active. As I mentioned, that gold uh, nano gold is used uh, for uh, oxidation of many toxic gases, many organic compounds into less toxic counterparts. Surface plasmon comes because of uh, conduction electrons. So in bulk gold, you have got three electrons in bulk predominantly. Whereas in nano gold, you have got free electrons on surface, and that leads to surface plasmonic bend. There and is a question and, for the synthesis of pyrochlores. Uh -huh. Which type of conversion reaction will be optimized by employing them as catalyst? The question is about pyrochlores. Well, not I, all pyrochlores can be used as catalyst. There are some pyrochlores like Al2Zr2O7, which are so stable that you cannot use for any application like this. Uh, some pyrochlores like cerium based, samarium based, uh, sodium based can be used as catalyst. And uh, the pyrochlores, uh, the one which can participate in oxygen evolution or oxygen uptake or in crystallographic language, the pyrochlores which can sustain oxygen deintercalation or oxygen intercalation can be used in conversion reactions of organic compounds you can oxidize them. There is one last question, sir. Can metal oxide be tailored to have appropriate size defects or vacancies to fit hydrogen molecules? There are many examples, in fact, in my own group also. You can create cavities. In cav and then, then, then there are morphs. See, this question is very nice question. But if you want to confine hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, then good to work on uh, compounds which have got occlusion. There is a category of compound which is called as metal uh, oxygen framework, MOPS, metal oxide framework. So in this, you have got well-defined uh, occlusions, well-defined cavity, and you have got polarizability concepts fulfillment. So they are used for incorporating xenon, krypton, carbon dioxide, methane, etc., and hydrogen also. So this was the last question, sir, and I really thank you for the 
wonderful informative lecture from the basic concepts to all the advanced methods which you have covered. I'm sure all the undergraduate and our research scholars and um, master students will be greatly benefited from this and especially the books which you have recommended will surely subscribe them at our library so that all the students can think about working in this field and tailoring new materials. Just give me one minute. We are. I am coming on camera now. Okay. Uh -huh. Now I can see Tokir also. Uh, okay, so I think if there are no more questions, uh, okay, maybe we can conclude the talk. You can make the conclusion remark. But I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed uh, being part of this wonderful uh, conference which you are you are coordinating, and I was very appreciative of the kind of questions which were asked. Uh, it shows the audience were very attentive, not that they switched off the camera and went here and there. <laughs> so it shows that we have sincere audience uh, at Jamia, and they all have bright future ahead. That's it from my side. The participants giving you the very good compliments in the chat box. They are very much happy with your talk and they are much convinced uh, with the words that I said about you earlier. And sir, I am the witness uh, of uh, your energy and I have seen sir, actually why uh, I uh, used, uh, I have compared uh, you little bit with Professor Siana Rao track. Why? Because actually from 2006 onwards, I am uh, the witness to listen your name. Uh, by Professor Siena Rao in his talks, actually. He used to actually quote your work and he used to take your uh, name during his lecture. So, so kind of him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, sir, thank you so much uh, sir, to be part of uh, the indo US webinar and we are much thankful to you, sir. And, sir, definitely in future, we will have the in-person meeting uh, in Jamia and we will host you here and uh, thank you so much, sir. Yes, yes, be assured that I too look forward eagerly for my Jamia visit. Thank you so much. So, okay, we disconnect now? Yes, sir. Now you can disconnect, sir. Uh, dear participants, now uh, we are we are going to move to the last lecture which will be delivered by professor kv ramanujachari uh, so he will be uh, with us uh, in, within 10 minutes so we will have the break of uh, 10 to 15 minutes time and uh, after 10 12 minutes we will uh, resume here so please don't go uh, anywhere don't, don't disconnect your connection so we will wait for professor uh, chari he uh, must be here actually in US time. The time must be around um, uh, 4 o'clock or 4.30. So uh, by 5 o'clock, uh, he said that by, by, by 5 o'clock he will be here. So the time is going to match with our time. So within, yeah, he is very punctual. In 10 minutes time, he will be here. So thank you and uh, we will meet in 10, 12 minutes time. Uh, I am receiving several emails from the participants. They are asking for the feedback forms uh, on my email ID. 
so please actually we are distributing the feedback forms over here this is there is a barcode you can send uh, link is also there you can fill the form so uh, actually the uh, i am assuming that uh, the participants that are asking the feedback form by using email it means they are not here they are not present in the lecture so from tomorrow we will meet only on cisco webex not through youtube so they are saying that they are attached with the youtube i am actually observing the youtube channel also so can i can observe how many attendees are there who are actually looking over the uh, uh, youtube channel so actually we are distributing the feedback form using our chat box or uh, this is the mode uh, link is there uh, qr code is there thank you
Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Chai. Good to see you. How are you? Ah, uh, sir, I'm fine, sir. You're I'm in your office. Sir. You're in office. Yeah, I'm in office, sir. Okay. You too. You too. Yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, okay, would you be able to uh, allow me to share the screen? Yeah, sir, I'm giving you the uh, uh, presentation rights. Now, presentation rights are with you. Now, okay. you can share your slides, sir. Okay, so can we try to see if I can share it or not before we begin the session? Yes, sir. Yeah, there is a, yeah. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Just want to make sure that that is the case, and then. Um, okay. So how do I close this search here? Stop sharing. Maybe. Stop yeah. Sharing. If you yeah stop sharing. I use Zoom most of the time, but then it's okay. We'll learn. <laughs> so, what's the title of this? Here? It's five o'clock. Uh, no, it is six twenty-eight a.m. So it should be two minutes to five o'clock for you, right? Four o'clock. Yeah. It's three three fifty-eight for you. Three fifty-eight. Yeah. So you reach to your office huh? quite early. Oh, yeah, I told you uh, this is uh, I could have come earlier too, but this is much better because I go um, you know, like pick up a cup of coffee on my way and then come. Yeah, that's great, sir. We have Good. one more minute, sir, to start your lecture. Yeah, how is the uh, attendance so far? Good? Yeah, attendance is good, sir. Now uh, there are uh, 144 participants with the Cisco WebEx and uh, uh, some 50, 60 participants with the YouTube links. Okay. So how many are right now? Not many. Uh, 145. 145. Oh wow, that's pretty good. So, so we'll finish. Yeah. Can we start, sir? Yeah. So good afternoon to all of you. I welcome you all, including Professor Chari, in our last uh, keynote lecture. And I will strongly welcome uh, Professor Chari from US on the basis of our participants, my university, my colleagues, and whole organizing committee. Uh, Professor Chari is an inorganic materials chemist with several years of expertise in synthesis, structure, composition, and property evaluation of various functional materials. He is currently a tenured full professor at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Rowan University, Glasgow, New Jersey. Professor Chari has nearly 250 research publications in peer refereed journals with research citations of more than 6,000, H index of 45, and I10 index of 120. During the last 10 years, Professor Chari has published several papers related to the art of fabricating nanostructures, employing novel inorganic synthetic methods, and reported distinctly different physicochemical properties compared to their bulk counterparts. Prior to joining to Rowan, he was involved in the synthesis of various either to unknown inorganic materials and discovered important physical phenomena such as ferromagnetism, magnetoresistivity, electrochemical sensing, and unusual anisotropic phenomena, all with important implications in industrial applications. Currently, his research is focused on designing novel chemo and electrocatalytic materials for cost-effective hydrogen generation from water electrolysis and efficient conversion of biomass to valued added chemicals. We are welcoming Professor Chari, second time in Jamia Media Islamia. Earlier in 2016, Professor Chari has spent a long week time with us in the Gyan program. He was the 
foreign expert of that program and uh, he delivered the course lectures, many course lectures in that program and that program was very successful. And now with these words, I request Professor Chari to please deliver his keynote lecture on the design and development of novel electro and chemo catalyst for environmental safety. Sir, please. Thank you, Professor Tokir. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this conference and thank you very much for organizing it and uh, keeping me in your radar to give a talk here. I'm so honored to be here. And I still remember my time at Jamia. I spent a lot of time with the students at Jamia University and uh, it was such a great experience. It's still fresh in my memory. Uh, today, the talk is going to be uh, mostly towards students uh, about how frustrating things can be in terms of doing research and how do you overcome the frustrations and turning the failures into successes. Uh, so this is my journey into development of new catalytic materials, both for electrocatalysis and chemocatalysis. So I'll try to spend a little bit of my time, a purpose of doing this research and some of the successes and also the failures, because I'll teach you during this lecture how one can learn from the failures and turn the failures into opportunities to do further research. So with that, let me allow to share my screen here. I hope you all can see this. Uh, I hope you can uh, see this one here. So let me, so this is the title of my presentation on the design and development of novel electrocatalysts and chemocatalysts for environmental safety. Um, I'm currently in Rowan University as a professor. Uh, Rowan University is located in Glassboro, which is just right in between New York City and Washington, D.C. So if you draw a line, we are right exactly at the midpoint. So let me tell you why I was fascinated by this research. And this is something that you must have seen many, many times. Uh, so these are, these are all the renewable energy shares for the total energy consumption. As you can see, the renewable energy contributes only 9% of the total energy that is input. So the purpose is to increase this size of the pie from 9% to maybe 50% in the next 20 years. So the idea is, well, how do we reach the place? All right, hydrogen unquestionably is one of the uh, important fuels for the future. So production of hydrogen in a cost-effective and environmentally safe way is very, very important for uh, realizing this dream of increasing the renewables. So how is hydrogen generated? There are primarily five different ways of making hydrogen. Uh, one is the hydrocarbon reforming. You can also do reforming of ammonia. You can do biomass gasifications, and you can also use bacterium to produce biological hydrogen and photo and electrochemical methods are also being employed to produce hydrogen green bay. Unfortunately, majority of the hydrogen that is produced today is through hydrocarbon reforming, which is very dangerous to the environment, as I will show you. 48% of the global hydrogen is produced from natural gas. Natural gas is methane. So when you do the methane reforming, you get carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, all these are greenhouse uh, gases here. And 30% is produced from the oil, 18% is from the coal gasification technologies, and only currently 4% of the hydrogen is produced by the electrolysis of water. Now, water is plentiful, and if you can develop different methods or different electrocatalysts to increase the efficiency of the splitting of water to hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen is also another important com commodity I'm sure most of you know this in India right now, there's a shortage of oxygen. So perhaps by improving our electrical uh, processes, we should be able to make oxygen for uh, not only industrial, but medical and health purposes. So this is the major goal. So where is hydrogen used? So presently, uh, nearly half of the hydrogen that is produced is used to make ammonia. Ammonia is a great fertilizer. And to make ammonia, you know, the Haber process involves the reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia. So half of the uh, hydrogen is produced, uh, is used in the production of ammonia. The other half of the hydrogen is produced 
uh, that is produced is used to convert mostly heavy petroleum resources into lighter fractions. This is called the cracking. So petrochemical industry uses a lot of hydrogen to break the long chain hydrocarbons into small scale ones. So these are the primary uses. But the future uses are going to be very different than what I'm showing you. In future, we plan to use the hydrogen as a fuel in the fuel cells producing the electricity. So that is the purpose. So what's the advantages of using hydrogen as a fuel? Well, it's very light and, uh, uh, and it has very high energy density, about 2.6 times the energy compared to gasoline. The only problem with hydrogen is it requires huge volumes. So for example, if you have a car, a 15 gallon automobile gas tank contains 90 pounds of gasoline. So if you want to have energy equivalent, you need to have at least 60 gallons of hydrogen. That is as good as 15 gallons of gasoline, but the weight of hydrogen is only 34 pounds. So you gain significantly in terms of the weight of the automobile. So these are all the attractive features of hydrogen. Well, we did talk a little bit about uh, hydro production of hydrogen. So these are all some of the reactions that are used. You take a hydrocarbon, you steam reforming uh, methane, for example, you get carbon monoxide and hydrogen. This is how uh, more than half of the hydrogen that is used is produced. You can also do partial oxidations, autothermal reforming. A lot of uh, processes have been developed. And one thing that is common to all of them is the right hand side of the equation. You see carbon monoxide everywhere, and that is not good for the environment. <clears throat> so, these are all some of the techniques. I'm not going to get into the details because of the time constraints. But if somebody is interested, I'll be more than happy to come back and talk about the slides. So this slide basically talks about uh, uh, the partial oxidation of uh, hydrocarbons. Right? For example, you take methane and you, you don't supply stoichiometric amount of oxygen. You put on a small amount of oxygen and that will give you uh, a lot of hydrogen. At least one mole of methane will give you two moles of hydrogen plus a lot of heat in its exothermic process. So there's a lot of chemical engineering involved in terms of uh, making this process happen. You can also do a uh, thermolysis of water. But interestingly, if you take water, heat it to 2,500 degrees Celsius, it automatically breaks up into hydrogen and oxygen. So this process is called thermolysis. Uh, well, this is attractive. So if you can somehow produce 2,500 degrees Celsius and put water there, you're going to break water into hydrogen and oxygen. The problem, however, is how do you separate the gases and how do you effectively and efficiently carry out? The other part of it is, is there any way you can make thermolysis happen at temperatures lower than 2500 degrees Celsius? So can we split water to make hydrogen and oxygen at temperatures much lower than 2500 degrees Celsius? There have been a lot of uh, work that has been going on and there is something called sulfur iodine cycle so I'll quickly go that uh, for the benefit of the students and how this is done. So basically what you do is you use sulfur dioxide and iodine. These are used as catalysts in the thermolytic splitting of water to hydrogen and oxygen. How is this done? In the step one, what you do is you take iodine, sulfur dioxide and water and you make two of the strong acids. One is hydroidic acid and sulfuric acid. This reaction can be carried out efficiently at 100 degree, 120 degrees Celsius, pretty low. And the hydrogen iodide and sulfuric acid can be separated by distillation. And once you do that, you take sulfuric acid, you heat it at 850 degrees Celsius, you're going to get oxygen sulfur dioxide back. So that sulfur dioxide can go back into the step one there. And similarly, if you take hydrogen iodide, you heat it at 450 degrees Celsius, effectively, you can make hydrogen and iodine is released. So this iodine and the sulfur dioxide from this step two can be brought into step one. So this is a thermolytic cycle. So the interesting feature is, instead of using 2,500 degrees Celsius, you can do uh, effectively the splitting of water at about 850 degrees Celsius. So there's a lot of effort going on in the world to reduce the temperature even further and see if you can effectively split the water using chemical means. So there is also a lot of effort going on on using the wasted biomass. As you know, we have about 220 billion tons of biomass globally that is wasted. So if you can do uh, treatment of the biomass, you can also produce hydrogen. And uh, basically the yields are about 12 to 17% hydrogen by weight of the dry biomass. That is one way of making hydrogen. 
and photobiological processes are also being uh, explored for the production of uh, hydrogen. Um, currently, this technology is in research and development stage, and theoretical efficiencies is only 24%. Uh, all of, most of you are uh, familiar with the photosynthesis, uh, how nature beautifully uses the carbon dioxide and the oxygen you know, uh, and the sunlight to produce the glucose and all that stuff. Uh, but if you look at all those processes, even in the nature, the photosynthesis is only 2% efficient. So it's not really great. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in terms of improving photobiological production of hydrogen. So the main topic for today is going to be electrolysis. Electrolysis is basically the technical term uh, using the electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Everyone knows this because we have been taught about the electrolysis of water right from eighth grade in the schools. So we take water um, and then put some electricity, anode and cathode. At the cathode, you have hydrogen. At the anode, you have the oxygen. Things look very simple. But then the issue is how much energy is used, what is the efficiency of the electrolysis, and what are the costs of manufacturing the anodes and cathodes. So these are very important topics. So when we get into the details, these things become extremely important. So let me give you an idea about how hydrogen-based economy is going to be in the future. On the left-hand side, I have the bar graph that shows you the calorific value of uh, burning hydrogen. Hydrogen of all the fuels gives you highest amount of energy per gram, 127, compared to gasoline or methylene or propane. These are all very small, but hydrogen is very good, excellent material. And you can make hydrogen from natural gas, coal, biomass, solar thermal, solar photoelectrics, photovoltaics, hydrothermal, wind energies, nuclear electric, all this stuff you can produce electricity and use the, do electrolysis to make hydrogen. This hydrogen can be used in transportation, buildings and industry and so many other ways. So this is the future of our hydrogen-based economy. Coming to the electrolysis, well, this is the familiar picture that we all know. You have two test tubes, you have the water, you uh, supply electricity through an external battery. Um, so at the anode, you have uh, the oxygen being produced and the cathode is the hydrogen. Well, this process is not really efficient. It's only 50 to 70% efficient. Uh, but the easiest way of making hydrogen, so you take water that is plentiful, uh, so you can just do the electrolysis. The way it happens, people believe, is on the surface of the cathode, you have the protons getting reduced by the electron to make the uh, nascent hydrogen atoms. The star here refers to the catalytic site, and these nascent hydrogen atoms bring together to make the hydrogen gas, so the overall reaction is the reduction of protons to hydrogen. Well, the issue is how much potential is required. Thermodynamically, you may get some numbers, like for example, 1.23 volts, but then there is something called over potential. So whenever you have gases released at the electrodes, you need to supply a potential in excess of the thermodynamically predicted values. That excess potential is sometimes known as the over potential. So the name of the game here is to reduce the dollar potential as much as you can so that you will not be spending more energy than what is needed to split the water. That is where the cost comes into the picture. Right now, the best material that can do that with very small oil potential is platinum. Unfortunately, we all know platinum is so expensive. So if you want to make this uh, on a commercial scale, we don't have enough platinum to go around to make the hydrogen that is needed for our industry. So clearly we need to think about an alternate materials other than platinum. Similarly, uh, the best material for the anode is iridium oxide, IRO2, which is a rutile structure, um, but then iridium is also expensive. So once you come to the nuts and bolts of the process, suddenly things become really not very attractive. So the idea of our research is to find materials that will effectively and efficiently replace platinum and make the electrodes with earth abundant materials, cheaper, cheaper materials with the same type of efficiency. So that is the game that we've been playing. So um, 
this is the photoelectrical uh, hydrogen production. Uh, basically, this tells you platinum uh, has a near zero potential, but it's very expensive. So what we have been doing is we were looking at the nature, and in the nature, some of the bacterium has the cubane clusters made from iron, nickel, sulfur, and cobalt. And these cubane clusters, you can imagine that as a cube, uh, every corner is alternated between iron and sulfur, so that's where you get a cubic structure. That is in the nature. But how do I mimic the nature? So what we found was the closest material you can have a cubane like structure is what we call a thiospinel. A spinel is basically AB2O4 type of crystal structure. Some of you are familiar with the solid state chemistry, know this already. You have a face centered arrangement of the oxides into which the tetrahedral and octahedral sites are occupied by the transition metals. So when you now look at the uh, structure of the spinels, you see fragments of that cubane in that structure. So we thought this may be a good material to start looking at the production of hydrogen. Basically, the name of the game is to replace platinum. So we don't want to use expensive metals. We are using iron, nickel, cobalt, which are almost like a fraction of a cost compared to the cost of uh, uh, platinum. All right, so the first thing that we start with, first of all, we start with the well-known thiospinel uh, Fe3. S4. So the way we can look at this is uh, something like Fe, Fe2, S4. It's like AB204, that type of crystal structure. This is well studied. This is known material for a long time. So we were able to make this in the nano form. And the idea is using this cubane clusters, iron sulfur cluster here, to see if we can somehow effectively reduce the water to make hydrogen. All right. So this is how we made our membrane assemblies. So there is a, because some of the sulfides are not conducting, so you need to put a conducting carbon, and these are all the catalyst particles. We kind of make what we call membrane electrolysis. The process efficiency is controlled by how well you make your membrane electrons. So there is a lot of art involved, and there are companies in US that are professionals in terms of making the membrane electrode assemblies. So you give your material and they will make the uh, electrode assemblies. For our laboratory, however, this is how we used to make small scale. And this is a, you know, four pronged uh, round bottom flask into which you can put the working electrodes and uh, all the electrolytic stuff. You can also put a uh, temperature um, measurement measuring device. You can also put a pH probe to see what the pH of the system is. So this is a very simple system. So what we have done is initially we started with three thiospinels, iron, nickel, and cobalt. So in electrochemical cells, especially in three, elect three electrode assemblies, generally people use platinum as a counter electrode, but we want to eliminate that too. So we kind of used a diamond electrode, which is uh, much cheaper, about 40 bucks, you can buy one. And that eliminates any possibility of the counter electrode acting as a catalyst in the electrolytic splitting of water. So you need to uh, remove all possibilities. So this is how we have done. And uh, to make the uh, long story short, this kind of gives you a summary of the performance of all these spinels. Our reference material here has been molysulfide, molybdenum disulfide, which has been shown in the literature as an attractive alternate to platinum. So our idea is to make materials that are much better than molybdenum sulfide. As you can see from this graph, clearly nickel iron 2 S4 has outperformed the molybdenum sulfide. The molybdenum sulfide has an over potential of approximately 0.6. However, we were able to reduce that to over potential by 0.2 units, which is significant, uh, and be able to absorb a very stable performance. So here is a great success story until you start looking very carefully of what is happening here. So Clearly, we were excited about the result that NiFeTS4 is much better than molysulfide. Then we started looking at the microscopic eye to see what is giving NiFe2S4 such a superior performance. To our surprise and to our frustration, we found that this compound, although is 98% pure, it had a very small impurity of nickel sulfide. That's a beta nickel sulfide. All right, so 
then it started bothering us is the activity from NIFTS4 or is it from beta nickel sulfide so beta nickel sulfide is a crystal structure like this there is a eight shared octahedral units of nickel uh, s6 octahedra so that's a brief crystallographic segment so what we did was why not we make this beta form of nickel sulfide and see if it has an electrocatalytic activity so here is x-ray powder pattern uh, Millerite is the name of the natural mineral that is nickel sulfide, which is the same crystal structure as the one. So we were able to replicate that synthesis and we did nickel sulfide work. So here is the comparison of the thiospinols versus nickel sulfide. On your right hand side, you see the ore potential, which started at 0.4, in fact improved to almost like uh, 0 0.35 and was very stable. So Nickel sulfide then is far superior to even nickel iron sulfide. So then we thought, well, nickel sulfide, these things have never been reported in the literature to the details that I'm showing you here. So then we thought, well, what other phases of nickel and sulfur might be interesting? So then we looked at uh, phase diagrams. There's a beta form of nickel sulfide, there's an alpha form of nickel sulfide, and there is also Ni3S2 that is also known in the literature. So then we said, well, why not we check those things to see if any of these things show superior activity and again compare them with the Ni3 uh, S2 showing the black here, not as good. And the alpha form of nickel uh, sulfide is also not as good, but the best one is the beta form of the nickel sulfide, which is better than molybdenum disulfide, better than any of the thiospinels. So we were very excited. Great. So then we started looking at how stable are these materials under pH. So we have studied uh, pH uh, 0, pH 7, and pH 14 of all the samples. Uh, as you can see at pH 7, the performance is not very good in the neutral pH. Uh, then we started look, looking at why is this? In fact, this is the case whenever we use nephion, because the protonic conductivity of the nephion membrane uh, is not very good at pH 7, and that is what is hampering the activity of the materials. So, but at pH 0 and 7, uh, we have very good activity. One of the interesting aspects here is when you look at the pH 0 or 14, the ore potential is exactly the same initially. This is very uncommon. Uh, so, we're also pursuing this, why is this potential independent of the pH? And then we looked at uh, the stability of the nickel sulfides and uh, well, the top one is the platinum, which is at pH zero. And we have nickel sulfides uh, at about 0.4. So these are pretty good, nickel is much cheaper. But the biggest problem we found was when the electrodes were repeatedly used for a long time, we see a corrosion here. This is not good for industry. Not only we see corrosion, we also see the plastic being eroded by the process. So while nickel sulfides are extremely good, wonderful plate catalysts and uh, uh, have a lot of potential, they do have practical implications. So in research, what you do is, well, this is good for publications, but for industrial applications, you don't want to show these things. Right? Because the industry doesn't want to see the plastic being eaten away uh, by the corrosive atmosphere of the process. So the idea is then how do I make a compound with nickel that is corrosion resistant? So this is how we start learning from our failures. So we see some successes, some failures, and some opportunities for improvement. So as we were doing the research, we find that instead of sulfides, the phosphides are much better in terms of corrosion prevention. So what we did was we completely redesigned the cell. Instead of using plastic, we used the Teflon and uh, you know, all that stuff. But the idea is, can we explore the phosphide families as good catalysts? Although sulfides are good, but they do have uh, long-term issues in terms of the stability. So when we looked at the DFT calculations of various nickel phosphides, what we find is, uh, this is where the platinum is, if you can see my arrow here, and nickel is well below. 
So on the right hand side, I'm showing you the direction of increased electrocatalytic activity. So platinum is definitely better than nickel, but then if you have Ni2P, it's even better than platinum. So there are some groups in uh, Penn State, Tom Maluk people, they have investigated Ni2P and found that it is superior to platinum. But the problem is only one of the crystal phases, that is the 001 phase with the HKL Miller indices, had the highest activity, but it was nearly impossible to make nickel phosphide completely in the same plane. So the point is, uh, whenever we make nickel phosphide, you get all the phases equally exposed, so the overall activity is diminished. But then the question as a solid state chemist we ask ourselves is, is that the only phase that is possible between nickel and phosphorus? Is it possible that we may have other phases of nickel and phosphorus? So we go back to the good old phase diagrams. What you see here is the nickel to phosphorus. You see, this is a binary phase diagram, so beautiful here. See how many different phases you have here. It is 15, 16 different compounds, and none of them have been explored for electrocatalytic activities. The only compound that was uh, reported was Ni2P right here. Other than that, then we have NiP2, Ni4P5, Ni5P2, Ni3P, Ni5P4, so many phases. All right, so again, as a solid state chemist, which part of the phase diagram do you pick? Again, your choice should be limited by whatever the industry wants. The industry does not want somebody, some compounds that are formed at very high temperatures. So what I did was basically limit our investigation into the phases that form below 400 degrees Celsius. And industry, the lower the temperature, the better off they are. And even here, I have about six different phases, compounds. Ni2P is only one of them. So the idea is, why not we take all these compounds, make them systematically, and study their electrocatalytic behavior to see if any one of them uh, performs better than the nickel phosphide. We already know nickel phosphide is better than platinum. All right, so these are all the four different phases that have been prepared, Ni2P5, Ni2P, Ni5P4, Ni2P2, and uh, some of the compounds are made at extremely nanoscale, 10 to 20 nanometers. The conditions of the synthesis are reported here. I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but you will. Uh, we were able to control the particle sizes by the temperatures and the uh, solvent medium that was used. For the NFIP4, uh, the best we could make was 200 nanometers, but then I for P5 and I2P, uh, we were able to make almost up to 10 to 20 nanometer size. All right, so these are all small particles. Then we started investigating the materials. I'm not going to bore you with all the uh, different things, but I'll show you only the uh, important results here. What we find is Ni5P4 uh, performed much better than Ni2P. The performance of Ni2P is given in the red line here, which is about 0.25 volts excess potential, that is over potential, but Nf5, Ni5P4 has only 0.1. Platinum is still the better, of course, 0.1, but we are only 50 millivolts above platinum, and it's also extremely stable. So this is the best part of it. So in other words, by looking at the phase diagram, we were able to discover a phase that performed better than the Ni2P and close to the platinum. So of course, once you discover a material, you have to do a lot of work. You have to study the pH dependence. Uh, what is the stability under various pH values, pH 7, pH 14, pH 5. And what we find basically is Ni5P4 uh, the activity depends on the pH, but then the stability does not depend on the pH. So in other words, it is stable and raw pH and membrane optimization is something that we are currently doing. So basically we are also optimized the exchange current densities, not only the water potential, but we also need to have good exchange current densities and also reduce the Tafel slopes. So we studied all that stuff. Currently we are now looking at different ways of bulk producing the nickel phosphides. So this is, you see how we started. We started with the biological compounds, cubane clusters to thiospinels, to thiospinels to phosphides, from phosphides to phase diagrams and discovering new material. That's exactly what I mean 
when I set the title on the design and the development of materials. So this is how you go, you get frustrated, but every failure teaches you a lesson, and then you go back and you know, there's a lot of literature available, and so much of this area is open. Anybody can pick up any compound here and study the electrochemical activities. Uh, if the nickel works well, so why not the moly? Moly oxides and phosphides also should have a good shot at this. So what we have done is we were able to develop uh, solar exfoliation techniques where we can just use uh, uh, a magnifying lens as a focusing point for increasing the temperature. So instead of using a furnace, we can use a magnifying lens in the sunlight and uh, shine it. And then you can heat up, you know, compounds and we're able to make uh, uh, molybdenum dioxide and molybdenum oxysulfides on graphenes. So basically what we do is we take ammonium tetrathiamolybdate and mix that with the graphite oxide and then ex uh, expose that to the uh, magnifying lens for two seconds. And suddenly the whole thing exfoliates and forms molybdenum oxysulfide on graphene. So these are all the powder x ray diffraction patterns that show you. So uh, the uh, uh, tetrathia molybdate has completely amorphous, but as soon as you do the solar exfoliation, you get into the few phases of molyoxides. And we also did the ICP analysis and we found a small amount of sulfur being impregnated into the molybdenum dioxide total structures. So again, these are the microstructures of the compounds. And this kind of tells you uh, that the, the graphite oxide, you have the 3200 FTIR peak, and after solar exfoliation, that's completely gone here, which tells you that we have uh, a nice graphene uh, on MOO2. Again, when we did the electrochemical activity, to our uh, surprise, we found these compounds, the molybdenum oxysulfides, also showed uh, pretty good, uh, uh, very small ore potentials and good exchange current densities. So, for example, if you look at the right hand side of the plot, um, the blue one here corresponds to the uh, molybdenum dioxide and the black one here corresponds to the platinum. You can see the exchange current density is pretty, pretty good, as good as uh, platinum here. Um, and then we were also looking at the Tefl slopes. Basically, the smaller the uh, Tefl slope, the better the activity is. It is basically the amount of excess potential you need to apply to get a decade jump in the exchange current density. So the smaller the potential, the better off you are. Platinum, for example, has 32, and the moly oxide has uh, 47. The pure molybdenum dioxide has uh, 72. So the graphene molybdenum dioxide composites are also very good now for producing electricity by the process of water. And on the right-hand side, we show you the chromatograms to make sure that the gas that is produced is hydrogen, and the amount of hydrogen produced increases with the potential and the time. So these are all the proof of the concepts. So basically, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities. So you can do graphenes, you can use uh, nanowires, you can use uh, molysulfide and reduced graphene oxides, tungsten carbide mixtures. There's a lot of work that is going on. As you can see, the whole idea is to replace the platinum with the most cost-effective and efficient electrocatalyst. So this is where we are with the molybdenum dioxide. Uh, our study shows that we are pretty good here, 0.12, uh, and Tefl slope of 47, which is pretty acceptable, and moly is very cheap compared to platinum. And we also looked at the stability, and we find the compound has an excellent stability for 20, 30 hours, uh, even better than that too. And then we said, well, if the oxides, sulfides, everything works, how about the other transition metal phosphides? Remember, we talked about nickel phosphides. So how about molyphosphides? Again, we looked at molyphosphides here. Uh, we made the commercially uh, procured the molyphosphides. We did the ball milling to reduce the particle sizes and looked at the electrochemical performance. Again, we see uh, as you reduce the particle size, you start improving the electrocatalytic reduction efficiencies. So there is again opportunity if somebody can make molyphosphide MOP uh, in a nano form, you should be able to develop new catalysts in that direction. So this is all some of the ongoing research we have here. And these are all the uh, stability of the molyphosphides and the gas chromatograms telling you that we are clearly producing hydrogen gas. So to summarize the part that we have done so far, well, you can do phosphides, you can do ball millings, you can do 
design of new materials, the whole idea here is to develop cheaper materials which are cost effective, which are environmentally stable, and that can produce hydrogen at very small ore potentials. So this is the story of the development of electrocatalysts. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, I think another 15, 20 minutes perhaps. Okay. So I'll now switch my gears and change my hat into chemocatalysis to see how we can use the knowledge of solid state chemistry in organic materials in developing materials uh, for chemocatalysis. All right. So basically our idea here is to take wasted biomass like corn uh, uh, with cotton scrubs. Now, once the cotton is taken out, the entire plant is burned in the field. I mean, you have seen that happening in your villages. Uh, that is not being claimed by animals. Animals don't eat it. Uh, crab grass, fish grass, animals don't eat. Uh, so what happens is the farmers dry it and then burn it. The idea is, can we use those wasted biomass and turn that into some value added chemicals? So, for example, um, we have tons and tons of that being produced. Uh, biomass is a product from carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight that is a photosynthesis. So, basically, if you can use the biomass and convert that into value added chemicals, you will get some kind of uh, renewability and sustainability. So, nature produces about 220 billion dry tons of biomass per year. That is huge amount. That is about uh, 45 exajoules. An exajoule is about 10 to the 18 joules. Just to give you an idea, we can use 220 billion dry tons of biomass produced on this planet to, to make 45 exajoules of energy. All right? Um, just to give you an idea, the total amount of energy used by United States per year is about 94 exajoules. So you can give supply almost nearly 50% of the total energy needs of a country of the size of United States using just the wasted biomass. And this is renewable energy. So this is how important this area is. So to bring this point here, so most of the plants have lignocellulosic material. They have lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose. These are the three most important components of any plant. The amount of lignin is small, but you know it varies from plant to plant, 15 to 20 percent. This can also be separated out, and you can use uh, that with, uh, to make phenols, gasoline, aerines, and diesel. So lignin is uh, getting very important now. The other part of it is you have about 50 percent of the plant material is cellulose. So if you can take cellulose, break that into uh, glucose, and the glucose can be converted into levulonic acid or the uh, hydroxymethyl sulfurols, HMF, which is a platform chemical that can be used to make a lot of fuels, solvents, polymers, so on and so forth. You can also make acids and fuels. You can make resins, fuels, chemicals by xylose and xylates and sulfurols. So the idea is, how do we efficiently take all the wasted biomass, which is otherwise burnt, break it down? So there is a lot of stuff, pretreatment stuff is involved. We have been working on this for the last five, six years, uh, and we have some patents also in this area. Uh, so without getting into the technical details, I'll just give you the whole chemistry and how do how does a solid state chemist think about this problem and develop catalysts from this? All right. So the biomass conversion basically happens in three different ways. Uh, one is a biocatalytic process, like enzymatic catalysis, or you can do chemocatalytic process, which is what I'm going to show today, and chemical modifications of biopolymers. Basically, you can make platform chemicals, pools of molecules, functional biopolymers, and you know from there you can make surfactants, lubricants, foams, plasticizers, binders, paper, paints. Sky is the limit. So much you can make with the wasted biomass if we uh, develop good catalysts. All right, so the conversion of hydroxymethyl furfural from glucose requires two steps. One thing is the glucose has to be isomerized to fructose and the fructose has to be dehydrated to make hydroxymethyl furfural. So basically you are now looking at two different acid catalysis. The first step requires Lewis type of acids and the second step requires Bronsted acids. So the idea is, can we 
design, again, the word design is very important, a catalyst that can have both protonic conductivity, which is the brown state conductivity, and Lewis acids. So where do we go about this and how do we develop a catalyst that is bifunctional? In other words, we want to carry out both of them in just one step. So years of experience, you know, who have been working in uh, a lot of phosphide materials 20, 30 years ago. So suddenly I thought of uh, using zirconium pyrophosphate. This is the crystal structure of the zirconium pyrophosphate. Uh, for an untrained eye, this looks very complex, but uh, for a trained eye, it is very simple. It's a sodium chloride type of structure. You have uh, uh, P2O7, which is basically, we have a bridging oxygen and that bridging oxygen connects two PO3 units. So if you look at this tetrahedral PO3 units, the midpoint of the bridging oxygen occupies the chlorine site of sodium chloride and the zirconium occupies the sodium site of sodium chloride. And that's all the structure is. But the beauty of it is because I have a diphosphate here, there's a lot of open space you can see here. So there is a lot of chemistry that is possible here. So what we try to do is zirconium, which is tetravalent. So we kind of replace one of the zirconiums with two ions one is yttrium which is three plus the other one is lithium which is one plus so three plus one plus charge compensation is done and the additional lithium has a space here in the structure because this is a very open structure and zirconium pyrophosphate is uh, also a very interesting compound uh, in that a lot of compounds expand when you heat right uh, that's called positive thermal expansion but zirconium pyrophosphate is just the opposite when you heat it it shrinks so it's a negative thermal expansion material. Although we're not using that part of the equation, we're just using that space here to create new lithium plus ions or sodium plus ions, which can be exchanged with protons. So what is the idea now? I have zirconium four plus, which can be a Lewis acid, phosphorus five plus, which can be a great Lewis acid. And then if I can exchange the lithium with protons in the open structure, I also have a Bronsted acid now. So this is how, one can take a catalyst, tweak the chemical composition, and create both Bronsted and Lewis type of acids. And when we did this, we can see conversion efficiencies of almost 80%, unheard of. It is just amazing. If you take the fructose here, with the catalyst and a co-catalyst, we were able to improve the performance almost up to 80%. For the glucose conversion, we got up to 60%. For sucrose, it is 50%. The best part of it is this is a one part catalysis. So both the isomerization and the dehydration are happening on the same catalyst. So on the bottom, I give you the conditions. We use 100 milligrams of sugar, 50 milligrams of catalyst. The catalyst can be recycled many times, absolutely no problem. And uh, digline and uh, sodium chloride, we use it a little bit. Uh, the reaction conditions are about 150 to 180, and time is one to three hours. That's about no, it doesn't take a long time for the 80% conversion. So if you look at the temperature dependence, we find the maximum efficiency is found about 150 degrees Celsius. So this is the optimum temperature. And if you look at the reaction times, the optimum time is about one hour. After one hour, there is not much uh, improvement in terms of the conversion. So one can stop essentially at one hour. And when I say catalyst zirconium pyrophosphate, uh, the entire thing goes in. So that's a zirconium, yttrium, proton, P2O7. That is the actual catalyst that we're using here. All right, so we were able to get 80% uh, of yield achieved in one hour. This is, to our knowledge, is the best catalyst that is available. Most of the catalysts have an efficiency of about 40 to 50, maybe best in the 60, but no one in the literature has reported 80% uh, efficiency in one hour at such low temperatures. So this is a very great achievement in terms of hydroxymethyl furfural. And we also looked at uh, different solvents, effective solvents, diglime, uh, brutal alcohol, and DMSO, and we find the DMSO to be good. And we also looked at the catalytic uh, recyclability, and, and you know, we were able to uh, recycle it pretty easily, uh, you know, just take it out, decolorate it, and just heat it up a little bit, and then you can bring back your catalytic activity. All right, so and of course, the rest of it is most of you, some of your organic chemists know this. There is a workup after the reaction. You need to take this, purify this, and also you got to do your NMR. So when we did the crude, the NMR was not clean. 
but after recrystallization, the NMR is pretty clean. Um, so we were able to make HMF very reproducibly, and we also looked at the purity of the co compound. Before recrystallization, there was uh, some noise here in the HPLC, but after recrystallization, it's so clean. And we also compared our product with the industrial standard. <coughs> so we purchased a HMF from outside vendors and compared HMF prepared in the lab. As you can see, they're exactly uh, same. So this one HMF is about uh, $55 per gram. And the cost of making HMF in my lab is uh, hardly penny because we're just using uh, glucose and fructose, so which are very cheap. So what do we do with this HMF? Of course, there are so many applications of HMF, but one of the things that we were interested is to see if we can somehow catalytically convert hydroxymethyl furfural to furane dicarboxylic acid. This is a, again an oxidation part. So again, we go back to our inorganic chemistry and then see what transition metals are good for oxidation catalysis. So if you go through the literature, you find in general, the compounds uh, derived from cobalt or manganese or tend to be excellent catalysts for the oxidation. So we went back and started designing those catalysts. Uh, but before that, I want to tell you the purpose of this is, uh, right now the plastic that we're used is made from uh, gasoline, which is uh, not a renewable resource. So we want to remove the petroleum component of the plastics and use the plants. So you take the plant, you convert that to uh, cellulose, cellulose to glucose, glucose to fructose, fructose to hydroxymethyl furfural. And if you can somehow use that as a component to make the plastics. So in industry right now, they use tartaric acid, which is produced from xylenes, which is again from gasoline, and polymerize it to make what we call the uh, polyethylene tartalates, PET bottles, essentially. So this is uh, petroleum-derived hydrocarbon. So if we can somehow replace the dicarboxylic acid here from tartaric acid to furane dicarboxylic acid, which is derived from plants, can we make the plastics? So that's the whole idea. And so to do that, again, uh, we need to look at the thermal stabilities. Uh, this is a platform chemical and uh, the US Department uh, of Commerce has recognized FTCA is one of the 12 potential important building blocks for the value added chemicals from biomass. In fact, you cannot even buy furane dicarboxylic acid commercially. We tried to buy it from a Chinese vendor. Um, they failed to give us the pure compound. That's how much demand is there and how difficult it is to make selectively furane dicarboxylic acid. The reason for that is when you're doing the oxidation on a compound that has uh, both an aldehyde functionality and alcohol functionality, you get a lot of uh, mixed oxidation products. So to selectively and completely oxidize both the primary alcohols and the aldehydes to carboxylic acids, you need to have a very strong catalyst. So, so here is the whole game, game plan here. So nature uses carbon dioxide and water and the light to create the biomass and biomass has cellulose and the cellulose can be broken down to glucose and glucose to hydroxymethyl furfural and then if you can oxidize that to furan dicarboxylic acid efficiently, you can polymerize that with ethylene glycol to make what we call the PEF, polyethylene furfurals. So these are again the plastics. In fact, Coca-Cola uh, company has been actively pursuing this technology with Avantium in Netherlands uh, to make this. I think countries like India, where there's so much of biomass, there is a huge opportunity for people to invest into research directions in this way and be able to create wealth from waste. And we have so much of waste in India, and this is one way of creating the plastics. And these plastics are biodegradable, unlike the pet bottles. So there is an environmental concern here too. So environmental safety is again, very important aspect of this research. So here is the challenge. So that is the hydroxymethyl furfural. Uh, you have a aldehyde group and a primary alcohol group. So when you oxidize, you perhaps may oxidize only the primary alcohol to aldehyde, which is the 25 diformal furan, that is partial oxidation. And this is again a very important chemical because recently people found that you can use about 20 to 30% of this in the diesel without compromising the efficiency of the fuels. 
So uh, that is again a big savings, just like uh, ethanol, uh, the base from corn is used for petroleum. You can use DFF for the diesel up to 20% of it. So this is one way. And you can also have oxidation of just one of the primary alcohols uh, uh, kept there and the aldehyde oxidized to carboxylic acid, or you have the aldehyde, but the alcohol being oxidized to carboxylic acid. And finally, the most important chemical that we are interested is we have we want oxidation of both the aldehydes and the primary alcohols, catalytically, not just uh, stoichiometry. Uh, one easy way of doing this is, of course, if you take hydroxymethylfluorol and add potassium permanganate, you get uh, 2,5 furan dicarboxylic acid quite quantitatively, but that is not catalytic, it is stoichiometric process. Industry wants something catalytic. All right, so that's the uh, challenge. So what we did was we purchased all of these chemicals individually from vendors, and then we carried out our catalysis using lithium cobalt and lithium manganese oxides. These are again the spinel structures. Remember we talked about spinel structures in the beginning of my talk. Again, I'm so fascinated with the spinels. So when you take the lithium manganese oxide and delithiate, you get a manganese oxide and a cobalt oxide. So mixtures of this lithium cobalt uh, manganese oxides at uh, 30 to 70 percent ratios. Of course, we change the ratios too. We find the most optimal conditions are temperatures between 50 to 150. Industry loves it. Uh, oxygen pressure is slightly high in this case, 200 to 800 psi, and the reaction time is 8 to 15 hours. Uh, we also tried acidic, basic, and neutral. Mostly basic, medium worked out very good compared to the acids because we're looking at the oxidation. Uh, so this is. Uh, uh, I don't want to walk you through this chart. This is how the compounds were prepared by uh, in a nanometric form. So our composition here, target composition is to make uh, lithium-2, cobalt, MN3, weight, which is almost like a double spinel compound uh, to use the this compound as the catalyst for our compound. So it took us uh, a while to make this compound and we were able to confirm the structural identity by extra diffraction and the particle sizes are almost 20 to 30 nanometers. We have done electron diffractions. We also have done ICP analysis, mass spec, to make sure that the amount of lithium cobalt to manganese ratios, uh, whatever the target ratio and whatever we used in the initial mixtures are not lost. So they're all pretty much conserved here. Uh, so this is the composition finally, Li2CO MN3 way. To our knowledge, uh, this is the first time that uh, a double spinel is used for the oxidation of HMF2 uh, uh, phenol dicarboxylic acid. This is the power reactor, high pressure reactors that we used. Um, so we take the hydroxymethyl sulfurol and use sodium bromide um, and lithium cobalt manganese oxide and treat it for five to 18 hours. And then the products were analyzed. So what we did was on the top, you see, we made a cocktail of the HMF, HFCA, FFCA, FDCA, and DEF, all of them mixed together. And this is what the chromatogram looks like. And the bottom is the chromatogram of the compound that we prepared after the catalysis. As you can see, the lithium-2 cobalt manganese-3 manganese O8 selectively oxidizes HMF to FDCA without any presence of partial oxidation products. This is a very, very important uh, thing. Um, so, and then, of course, once you make this compound, you further purify for organic chemists, that's uh, very normal. So, kind of go through recrystallization, decoloration, and finally, we did the proton and the carbon-13 nanomars, and we find the exact match that of the FDCA. So, we successfully, catalytically, efficiently, and selectively converted HMF using the uh, a different design of the transition metal oxide. Spinners. Of course, there's a lot of work still going on. We still have to explore the possibility of various other combinations. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea about how solid state chemistry is used in the design and the development of new electro and chemo catalysts for reactions that are of environmental concern. And I thank you all for your attention. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a very informative lecture and uh, there are a lot of questions from the audience side, sir. So, uh, they asked in the chat box. So, I request uh, Dr. Fana Riyaz may ask 
uh, the queries of the audience uh, on behalf of them. Please. Good evening, sir. For now, how are you? I'm fine, sir. Thank you. Uh, the question that a participant has asked one of the participants is that is FDCA polymer conductive and how to polymerize it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, FDCA all by itself, which is perfluorine decarboxylic acid, right? Uh, you cannot uh, do the polymerization. What you do is you cross link it with uh, ethylene glycol. So you take uh, ethylene glycol, EG, and the FTCA, just the way you do the tantalic acid polymerization. And in terms of conductivity, uh, I don't think uh, these are conducting polymers. The second question is how to characterize polymorphic materials precisely when it is heteropolymorphic polycrystalline in nature? Uh, what do we mean by polymorphism? I need to have, because people have different uh, meanings when they use the word polymorphic. Are we talking about two different cryptographic phases? I think uh, the audience here means the num uh, a number of phases present because he has mentioned polycrystalline materials as well. So I yes. guess he wants to know the characterization of these materials. So for a solid state chemist, the first point of characterization is by X-ray diffraction, all right? So when you do the X-ray diffraction, and if your compound is known in the literature, you can compare your pattern with the existing library of compounds and see if it matches anything. If not, what we do is, if you think it's a new compound, then you have to try to make it as a single crystalline compound and do a single crystal diffraction to understand the crystal structure of the compound. And once you know the crystal structure, you can go back and make it in the polycrystalline form. So that is the most important characterization. Once you have a single phase, in my lab, I insist that we do uh, chemical analysis to make sure that the, all the elements are in the right uh, ratio. So that is one important aspect. We also do SEM studies, characterization, scanning, electron microscopy, and electron microscopy, basically, to find out the morphology of the compounds. And there again, you can see if there are polymorphism or different phases present, you can uh, figure that out. You can also zoom in into different domains to see if there is any compositional inhomogeneity across the samples. Uh, so these are, question is very simple, loaded, but the answer, uh, of course, we have a lot of tools today and what we had. The other question that is asked is, what is the role of conducting materials in catalysis? What is the mechanism of electron flow between conducting material and catalyst? <laughs> Are we talking about electrocatalysts? Yes. Well, there is an interfacial phenomena which is extremely complex. Um, one, but I try to make it look very simple. So the basically what you have is you have two ways you can do. One is your electrocatalyst itself could be a conducting material. That is the advantage platinum has. Platinum is both a catalyst and a conductor. But some of the compounds that I showed you here, unfortunately, are not conducting, but they are good catalysts. So the way you uh, implement this is you take non-conducting electrocatalyst mix it with the graphite ink or the carbon base and make it conducting. So that is how you can induce the electron flow into the non-conducting materials. So the surface reduction happens uh, when you have, like for example, nickel phosphide or molyphosphides on the transition metal size, when the protons come, the electrons are supplied by the catalyst and these electrons are thrown through the carbon ink. So to answer that question, if you can somehow design a catalyst that is as conducting as platinum and as good electrocatalytic activity as platinum, that will be wonderful. In fact, one cannot get a Nobel Prize for that. Because we solve the world's energy problem if we can find a cheaper alternative for platinum. Thank you for asking that question. The next is how to characterize, uh, no, is solar exfoliation a scalable process? Uh, I think yes, yes it is. In fact, if you look at Sweden, right, 
there have been solar collectors, reflectors. You can make them as uh, big, huge uh, mirrors, solar mirrors, and focus all the radiation to one central point and create very high temperatures. In fact, that is being commercially used in Sweden, uh, if I'm correct, for the reduction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. The so other question is, is uh, which properties of a chemocatalyst can be analyzed so that it will complete with the activity of photo and electrocatalyst? Hmm. Uh, I think the point I tried to show you is the physical properties that are required for electrolysis and for chemocatalysis are very different here. For electrocatalysis, you have need to have a very different set of parameters. Uh, for example, in chemocatalysis, the pH dependence is not as critical as it is in the electrocatalysis. Remember, when we do the uh, electrolysis, you are constantly changing the local pH because when you are using the protons, right, your acidity is going to change with the electrolysis. So you need to have a catalyst that is extremely stable against pH changes. You don't have that situation in chemocatalysis because you're not changing any pH. It's mostly uh, is there a uh, static reactor or a flow reactor? And uh, very rarely you use uh, uh, things. And another thing is, in chemocatalysis, you use very high temperatures. In electrolysis, you generally try to do the electrolysis at room temperature. So the parameters are very different. Both of them. Uh, then how can we determine the oxidation state of cobalt in cobalt substituted lithium magnesium oxide catalyst to further utilize it in another conversion for environmental safety? Beautiful question. Um, there are different techniques. The one that we use most directly is what we call XAPS technique, or uh, ZANES, X-ray absorption in rate spectroscopy. That kind of gives you an idea about the oxidation states of all the elements. You now you run a standard, and then you compare that standard with your compound, uh, that gives you pretty much the oxidation states of various metals. In our case, we believe the cobalt and the manganese are both in uh, 2 plus, 3 plus for cobalt and 3 plus and 4 plus for manganese. Then for the industrial scale, how to fabricate large area electrodes for electrochemical water splitting? And the size they've mentioned is 500 centimeters square. Uh, in fact, uh, there are commercial companies. Uh, one of the companies that comes to my mind is Geiner, which is in Ohio in the US. They make uh, electrolyzers for hospitals. So they, they have, unfortunately, those electrolyzers are expensive because they still use platinum and iridium oxides, uh, but they are very efficient in terms of electrolyzing water. So you put in water and you get hydrogen and oxygen from different ports and you can use that uh, that way. Uh, in India, there is a uh, SECRI, Central Electrochemical uh, Research Center in Karaikuti, and ARCI in Chennai, they have commercial scale uh, electrolyzers. So they are making membranes, you know, like a few thousand gallon reactions. So, yes, they can be scaled up. But one thing I to be careful, I'm sorry, I would like yes, to also remind people that. Uh, I think I tried to say that during my lecture, that membrane electrode assembly is the critical factor. If you don't have the art of making it properly, no matter how good your catalyst is, your products are going to be lost. Last. Okay. last question. There's a last question. What is the role of sodium bromide in the oxidation of HMS? <laughs> uh, I would rather not answer because that's almost like a, a proprietary material. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we've learned a lot from your lectures. And in fact, I remember last time when you had uh, given a, an informative lecture based on how we can produce furan from sugar. I still remember that in the Gyan lecture. So always, you know, your lectures are full of such information that how can we utilize the, I mean, the waste and the agriculture, because we are an agricultural country, we have so much waste and biomass production. So how it can be utilized to produce effective monomers, effective catalysts. I mean, this gives a big insight and many creative ideas come up whenever we, uh, uh, 
whenever we you know attend your lecture and we feel really grateful to you for sharing such wonderful and inspiring ideas and it's been really great today as well to listen to your lecture and I, there are so many ideas that have come up in our minds and i'm sure we are going to you know try and implement some of them so that we can get good proposals and the best part is that because you're in usa and the nature of funding there is entirely based on the technology and the production and the industrial the scale development this gives us a lot of you know motivation to develop products that can be used industrially so there is a drive here right now i mean lately for the past few years dst has also been focusing on these issues and it's really good if we can you know contribute something to our technology in the way of sustainable resource from natural products so your lectures are always full of such information and it's really inspiring you know it's inspiring you. for every faculty every graduate and postgraduate student we feel really motivated and thank you sir for sparing your valuable time coming up early morning i hope you have a great day thank you fun thank you thank you for those kind words thank you dr fana for uh, nicely uh, conclude the uh, final lecture uh, yeah so now uh, uh, we are at the end of uh, this webinar uh, so to start uh, with the very history i would like to tell uh, one important information to the participants I have received many emails from participants. They are asking that, sir, we have finished the webinar, so did we get the certificate? Actually, I would like to tell you that this webinar is attached with the lecture series. So, and uh, every day you have only two lectures. So, total there are uh, uh, 10 lectures remaining in seven days. So, it is not a big job uh, to listen to those informative lectures. So, we will actually give the uh, certificate for the webinar as well as for the lecture series combinedly, not separately. So uh, this is mandatory to attend the webinar along with the lecture series. So it will be actually very interesting and it will be very useful for you and uh, to attend uh, both the events. So thank you. So now uh, we are at the end of the this uh, webinar. So we have actually uh, placed a uh, minor valedictory uh, uh, program uh, to close this webinar uh, session only. So for this webinar session, uh, to close this webinar session, we have Professor Ashok Kumar Gangundi, who is presently the Deputy Director and Senior Professor of IIT Delhi, and Professor Chari, Senior Professor in Rowan University, New Jersey, USA. So I request uh, uh, first Professor Ashok Kumar Gangundi to please uh, present the valedictory remarks to our uh, participants, sir, please. Thank you. Uh... Hi, Professor Chari. Nice to see you back in your office. Uh, so uh, let me uh, congratulate Jamia Amelia Islamia and the Department of Chemistry and uh, Professor Toki Ahmed and all the uh, other uh, colleagues who have uh, helped in organizing this Indo-US webinar and lecture series. And uh, I think uh, uh, very good speakers have been uh, there and uh, I believe now next seven days you'll have the lectures. So uh, I, I would be, part, I heard at least, I think two and a half lectures and including mine, so it becomes three and a half lectures I have participated. So I must say that these kind of lectures, I think uh, would, uh, have clarified some of the uh, basics of uh, researchers who are working in energy, energy-related catalytic transformations, these kind of areas, uh, biomass transformations. So many such areas which are of relevance today. Uh, everywhere in, in the world, people are looking for uh, sustainability. And so that is a very important area young people need to work on how to make the planet sustainable. So we need to work with products uh, whose entire chain, uh, right from its manufacture to how we recycle, people are looking forward to. Those materials, those products will become important in the future. So many such things are important. The whole world is working on e-mobility, on batteries, 
on uh, fuel cells, uh, hydrogen storage, many, many such areas are of importance. And along with that, the modern uh, world is going to apply artificial intelligence methods to all these uh, areas of chemistry, material science, and physics. Uh, it is going to come in a big way, whether it is in healthcare or materials design, uh, sooner or later, uh, artificial intelligence will come into play. So I must thank the organizers, I think DST from our side and I think NSF in US, so it uh, organized this SPARK program, I think is uh, between these two organizations. And it is a very good program, and I hope this continues. Gives a good platform for many uh, students, young researchers, to hear people in two countries, from two countries. So uh, I, I wish us all the best for the success of the lecture series, and thank uh, the, all the speakers who have participated, and uh, all the organizers once again a great feeling uh, you should continue these kind of programs in future thank you thank you sir for giving a very good message to us to all the participants and uh, we are always uh, very happy to listen you sir so with these words i thank you sir and uh, now i request professor chari uh, to please uh, give the valedictory remarks to our uh, participants I think uh, what Ashok uh, said was appropriate and very accurate. Uh, one has to be looking at these technologies. The knowledge of chemistry is extremely critical in advancing all these technologies, whether it is hybrid uh, vehicles or space technologies. I mean, the world is moving so quick, and it is important that the universities have to have a curriculum in terms of educating students in these emerging areas of technologies. They should put half of the curriculum, I would say, in technologies for the future. Um, so, for example, I'm not quite sure how much of chemistry or inorganic chemistry is being taught in terms of the applied uh, areas. And I'm sure some institutions are doing, but we need to have a more national curriculum model, not just the IITs and the central universities, but we're talking about small universities where uh, this has to come and uh, the Infrastructure definitely in India is much better than what it was when I did my PhD 25 years ago. Things are improving really good. And I also see the youth participating actively into the research compared to what it was some time ago. And I think this is really what is happening to India is really good. Um, and it is going to uh, keep India moving in terms of the right direction. And we have to compete with a lot of countries. And I'm sure uh, this is going to be a healthy competition, and this will lead to great discoveries in the next few years that will revolutionize our thinking. Uh, and sustainability, as Ashok said, is very important in all these developments. Uh, one thing I also request people is um, whenever you develop technologies or any discoveries, you also have to think about the cost. If I were to implement that discovery into real life, how much would it cost in terms of manpower? You know, I mean, there should be economic aspects. So every PhD student should learn a little bit of economics and keep that as a chapter at the end. Even if the technology is not attractive, at least it gives the students an idea about how to translate uh, laboratory discoveries to scale up and industrial applications. I think uh, that is. Uh, I started seeing that because I am a thesis uh, evaluator for some European universities, and I'm seeing that, you know, they dedicate one chapter uh, on the economics of the process. So basically what you do is from cradle to grave, you know, like you do the analysis from start to the finish, and how much is involved, what is the cost of this chemical, what's how, much, how many hours of uh, manual labor is involved in making this compound. So they do a lot of calculations. It's kind of is very interesting. So uh, with that, I again wish the organizers uh, very great uh, coming next one week of uh, 
talks. I see those beautiful talks. I wish I was there for these talks. Very informative. And uh, I'm sure at the end of this conference, students will walk out with lots of ideas and that will keep them busy for the rest of their lives. And again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. We are always grateful to you, sir, uh, for your attachment, for your affection with us, for with the with the with our university with this program too. So uh, uh, yesterday, Dr. Fanadia in detail uh, delivered the formal vote of thanks. But now, uh, since we are actually closing this webinar season, uh, so this is my duty to deliver the uh, partial formal uh, vote of thanks. Uh, generally. Uh, if we actually look over the success of any program or any event, it depends uh, mainly on the audience and the participants. Uh, because being an organizer, it is our duty. It is our duty to approach to the wonderful speakers. It is our duty to approach to the uh, good scientists across the globe and uh, try to convince them, bring them on the same platform. But here today, I have seen that most of the audience and the participants have interacted well with the with the speakers and they have actually raised the quality of uh, questions and the, the number of questions were also significant and i have seen that i witnessed that most of the speakers were very happy to take the questions and appraise the quality of questions this was this part was actually very important very important for us and we are happy that uh, our participants uh, are happy with this program and we have observed uh, this using the quality of question that they have raised so uh, first of all i would like to actually thank uh, to my university administration my vice chancellor professor najma sir registrar dr najim hussain al jafri and the whole staff of the university my department uh, all faculty members of this department uh, for helping us to organize this event. Uh, I must thank the presence of uh, Professor Didi Sharma, who very kindly agreed to be part of the uh, inaugural session and deliver the plenary uh, talk. And he gave a very wonderful talk, uh, starting from the general concept, that is the miraculous world of uh, material, then touch uh, the, the height of the material so that the, the faculty members or the senior PhD scholars uh, may involve uh, with his lecture. Then uh, Professor Sarabjit Banerjee and uh, Professor Yon B. Mao uh, from uh, Texas University, Texas a &M University and IIT Chicago. Uh, they were very kind uh, with us uh, to be the part of this Spark team as well as the part of this Indo-US webinar as well as the lecture series. Then I must thank uh, uh, Professor Arun Chattopadhyay and Professor uh, A.K. Tiagi uh, to be with us from IIT Guwahati and BRC Mumbai. They also deliver a very interesting and important talk in spite of their busy schedule. And uh, Professor Chari, who actually who is sitting in his office in the very early time, 6.30, uh, probably he reached to his office uh, by uh, 5.45 or 6 o'clock, probably that. And he was very punctual to his time. I was much sure that he will be here uh, before time and uh, uh, everyone has uh, witnessed uh, on my point. And sir, you deliver a very wonderful talk and uh, the whole organizing committee, the whole department is very grateful to you for your presence and for your lecture. Uh, I must thank uh, Professor Ashok Kumar Gangali. He is very kind uh, for this department, for me, for my university. Uh, and uh, from yesterday, he has been attached uh, with us, uh, always he actually guiding us how to organize any event in very in a professional way, how to improve the uh, actually standard of uh, any event, uh, either it is a lecture series, webinar, conference, national or international. So uh, uh, he actually he remain involved uh, in all kind of activities that we generally organize. So sir, I must thank you for your wonderful keynote lecture for your presence today morning you have shared a session and now you have come and graced this occasion for the valedictory function thank you thank you so much sir and uh, actually any event is not possible without the uh, team effort team effort and everyone has seen that uh, this program 
is not a program of a single person or two person. This this program was a team effort person. I must thank Dr. Fanal Yar for hard work, Dr. Sapan Kumar Jain, uh, Dr. Abul Bashar, Dr. Zeba. They actually did a great, great job in the organization of this event. And my special thanks to uh, go to my students who are working with me in my lab. Uh, Amir did a great job. Huma, Huma, Farah, they are actually extracting the question. They are providing those questions to me and Dr. Fanal Yar so that we can approach to the speaker to ask uh, very frequently so that our program will not interrupt. Then uh, Fazil, Asim, and Naeem, they also did a very great job. So I must thank to all my students. And in the last but not least, I must thank the uh, Ministry of Education for providing us this part of team so that uh, for this scheme, we are sitting here. So thank you, thank you all, and uh, wish you good luck. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Tokir. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, Charlie. Good morning. Yeah, bye bye. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, bye, bye. We'll, we'll, bye. Good Thank you. Great seeing you all.